I see Councilmember Willie. Thank you. Councilmember Boy is here. Welcome back, Councilmember Moore. All right, so we will uh, start up again. It is 823. The item is number 14 under public hearings. Uh, this is a subject of abatement of public nuisance from weeds or other fire hazards pursuant to provisions of our municipal code 9.08 and resolution number 20-136 is a hearing for impacted property owners to contest the matter of proposed abatement. And I do have an earlier uh, request for a bifurcation. Uh, I'm going to ask for guidance from our city attorney as to how best to proceed. Uh, I did not uh, fully retain your recommendation. And so uh, my understanding is Vice Mayor Chow would like to bifurcate as to the consideration of her property. Madam City Attorney, how best should we go about proceeding at this point? If there's a recusal, um, the Vice Mayor should state it now. Oh, yeah, Vice Mayor Chow, Chair recognizes you. So um, I need to recuse the decision from uh, my property. So I'd like to request uh, segmenting the decision separately. Okay, uh, Madam City Attorney, Vice Mayor Chow properly brings forward a motion. Is that correct? Can she bring that forward with one of us motioning uh, to, or, or seconding it rather, or does someone else need to make that motion? I don't think you need a formal motion. I think as chair, you can consider first the hearing on um, Vice Mayor Chow's property within a motion to approve, including it in the abatement resolution. And then the council would consider the um, hearing for the remainder of the properties and okay. then have a motion and to approve the resolution. Okay. Understood, understood. So uh, Vice Mayor Chow, uh, we will go ahead and consider your property uh, under this item, uh, please. You know, I, I, whatever is appropriate, perhaps turn off your camera. Um, and uh, uh, Mayor, I do have a presentation, a quick presentation, if she would like to remain for that. Um, I, I think that Vice Mayor Chow can, can hear your presentation and can even see your presentation, uh, but we will be um, proceeding under initial consideration of, uh, of, of her home. Let's make the common presentation now and then once we conclude with that, we'll consider Vice Mayor Chow's property and then we'll reopen it up for um, uh, the, the entirety of the council to consider the rest after we have a motion on, on that property. So, so please proceed with your presentation. Okay, so uh, assuming you can see my presentation, uh, the purpose of the weed abatement program is to prevent fire hazards and other nuisances posed by vegetative growth and the accumulation of combustible materials. materials. The program is managed by the Santa Clara County Department of Agriculture and our city code chapter 9.08 requires property owners to remove or destroy weeds on their property for fire and public health protection. Owners are required to abate annually by April 30th and to maintain their properties throughout the year. The county prepares a report of all properties that have been non-compliant and provides that report to the city. All impacted parcels remain on the list for three years. If the parcels are found to be hazard-free according to the safety standards during that time, they will be removed from the list. The complete safety standards are enclosed in all mailings to property owners, but I have them listed here in general. The maximum grass height standard is six inches. Uh, property owners should clear vegetation 30 feet from any structures, combustible debris under eaves of houses, on roofs and in gutters, and branches should be cleared 10 feet from the chimney. I'm including a couple before and after photos. On the left, a non-compliant parcel, and on the right is a compliant parcel. Here's a vacant lot. On the left is non compliant, and on the right is compliant. Uh, there are a couple options for the homeowners to complete the required work to abate. Uh, option one, homeowner completes it themselves. Option two, the county assigns an authorized contractor to complete the work with the charges appearing on the next property bill. 
The county begins conducting property inspections on April 30th and through October. Uh, however, the parcel should be maintained throughout the year, as I mentioned. As part of the new city process, the county annual inspection fee is waived for compliant parcels. They must be abated upon uh, the inspection. And any waived fees are billed to the city to cover the county cost to inspect the property. On December 7th, the county mailed a notice to property owners listed on the report indicating that their property must be cleared of hazards according to the safety standards by April 30th and also notifying them of tonight's public hearing to consider any objections to the proposed removal. The city also, as part of their new process, sent a reminder letter to abate by April 30th and um, also to maintain their parcels year round. If council wishes to adopt resolution 21-002, ordering abatement of public nuisance, property owners on the report will have until April 30th to abate any potential fire hazards on their property. And the purpose of tonight's hearing is for impacted property owners to contest the matter of proposed abatement. And that conducts my presentation. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. I noticed that we do have a representative from the County Weed Abatement uh, Department. Uh, yes, Mo Cumry, who is the manager of the Weed Abatement Program, is here to answer any questions. Uh, yes, and uh, Mo, at this time, would you like to make any remarks uh, from the administration of that program? Welcome. Uh, the the programs run countywide. Uh, Cupertino is a, a big part of that. Um, we look at the properties during mainly just during the fire season, which for Cupertino is April 30th through the end of October. Uh, but right now we're having high fire season. So like your city clerk said, it should be maintained year round but our program is only going to maintain during those that one period of the year. Uh, it, it's a long period from, again, from April 30th to the end of October, but those are the only periods of time that we're gonna enforce the standards um, and uh, deal with fees being a concern for property owners. We did adjust, we do adjust the fees annually to ensure that they are cost recovery only. And you may have noticed that this year, the fees have gone down, uh, because we were able to control costs. So that's all I have for right now. Great, thank you very much, Mo. All right, so let us proceed with consideration of this item. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, identify the uh, property located at 10175 McLaren uh, to consider. Uh, I'll let my council know that the vice mayor uh, is, is able to appear as a member of the public of course, to uh, discuss this particular item. Um, but I may bring it back to, to Mo if you would like to make any commentary on that prior to um, any opening from the public on this uh, bit of the segmented item. Well, I think that I would first like, if the vice mayor is going to talk on this, I'd first like to give the vice mayor an opportunity to say her piece first, or the okay. property owner an opportunity to say their piece, and then I can respond. That sounds good, and consistent with uh, the, the, the practice of the past. Okay, so yes. uh, very good. Um, is there any member of the public that would like to speak on the address uh, that I sp stated earlier? I believe it was 10175 McLaren. Correct me, anyone, if I'm wrong. Uh, and so uh, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Uh, however, okay. Uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't see a hand raised in, in, in this uh, context. And so I will bring- Mayor, is this only for the McLaren property? Or that is, is correct. We have, we have segmented this. And so we are considering on, only that property right now. So only public comments related to that property, is that? That is correct, yes. Okay. thank you. You're welcome. Uh, is, okay, so I'll bring this back to council. Um, 
as well as to uh, as to our guest from the county, Mo. Uh, are there any comments on this uh, before I entertain a motion? This property was added in 2019. Uh, 2020 was uh, it was compliant. Uh, so it would be two, this year and next year, if it stays compliant, would come off the program. Okay. Uh, very well. I'll entertain a motion on this property. Okay. Uh, so I, I'll uh, remind uh, my council that the recommended action from our city staff is to adopt the resolution and so far as this particular property is concerned, um, number 21-002, uh, as well as resolution number 20-136, uh, having conducted the hearing for that impacted property uh, to contest the matter of proposed abatement. Um, so is there anyone that would like to move the recommended action for this property? So um, let me try this. I'll move to adopt resolution number 21-002. Should I read the whole thing? Ordering abatement. Uh, you can just say so moved because I've So already... moved. Okay. Good idea. <laughs> Is there anyone uh, who would like to second that motion? I'll second. Okay. Uh, Council member Way motions. Council member Willie seconds. Uh, any discussion on the item? Please raise your hand. Uh, seeing none, Madam City Clerk, would you please conduct a roll call vote? Uh, you'll need to unmute yourself, please. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Way? Aye. Council Member Willie? Aye. Mayor Paul? Aye. The motion carries with Chow recused. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, Vice Mayor Chow, please uh, feel free to return to our meeting as a participant. Welcome back. Uh, and so uh, the other segmented portion is uh, every other uh, property that is uh, on this list, um, with the exception of the one that we just uh, voted on in our motion. At this point, are there any members of the public that wish to speak on any of the properties under consideration? I do see one hand raised now, too. Uh, the, the first hand I see raised is only identified as call-in user one, call-in user underscore one. And so I will uh, unmute you at this point. Welcome. And I believe if you're calling in, you'll need to hit star six on your phone. Uh, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, welcome. Hi, this is Brent Bardsley, 10408 Menhart. Uh, the, the council should have received uh, uh, an entreaty from me uh, dated January 2nd, which I, I discuss my experience with the weed abatement program. This is my third year. Uh, I remind the council that uh, the council has uh, three times ordered my property removed from, from the weed abatement list. Uh, last February, the weed abatement manager said all the issues had been resolved. And, and I, also I presented a petition uh, last winter that uh, five of my neighbors, long-term neighbors, have attested that they've never noticed any weeds on my property. So I'd like to have my property removed from the list. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Brent. Our next speaker is Larissa Troche. I apologize if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Welcome, Larissa. Hi, I just had a quick question. I think I've submitted all the documentation on two parcels. I, I have the parcel number line 83 and 87 for 351960 Stevens Creek Boulevard. Is this an annual notification that I need to respond to or how does, I'm not sure how your policy works. I'm a property management company, so I don't exactly know what your procedure is, but it just raises the level of anxiety every time I get this notice. Is this something I need to look forward to every year or how does that work, Mo, perhaps? I, I guess that's a question for you, Mo. Okay, uh, I can actually answer both of the, the speakers so far. Uh, 
both Mr. Beardsley and this particular uh, caller, we've been in transition from an old database system that we were having trouble with to a new one. And during that transition, the data got transferred over. It took properties that had been deleted uh, or had been put into an inactive status and made them active in the new database. And that's why they got these letters. These are both actually inactive parcels. And so they're both being removed from the system. Um, so I, I just verified both with uh, Mr. Bardsley and I had verified earlier, and I believe you have a written challenge for the second speaker uh, in your packet already. So these are both dismissed parcels. Okay, uh, very good, thank you, Mo. Our next speaker, and again, I apologize for any pronunciation issues, is Hemalatha Yellamilli. Welcome, Hemalatha. Uh, hi, uh, yeah, you can call me Hema. Uh, this is the property picture at the time of inspection. Uh, we, you can see that other than the grass, rest of the property is well kept. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, it's not like we don't, we don't care uh, about uh, this program or the safety or regulations. Uh, it just it's just that during this time in March April, uh, the board was not working, and we had parents at home uh, uh, for visiting us and got stuck here, and we were very worried with the COVID situation and not sure if we can uh, get someone to fix the mower or it, it is a confusing time. So uh, at that time we were late on uh, cutting the grass. Uh, but if you see, look at the second picture, uh, this is how our property is. We keep it clean year round, but that one, that month or uh, during that uh, time when the lawn mower was broken, we didn't get it mowed on time. So you see the grass is grown a bit uh, 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 more than six inches. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is uh, we have been living in Cupertino for a long time and this is the first time uh, uh, it is not compliant. And it's not like we don't care, we care. And because of the COVID situation where it is scary, uh, the number of incidents growing every week, we were too scared to invite or uh, get someone to get it get the more fixed and that is the reason it was not compliant at the time if if our inspection were a week later you would have seen a different picture we wouldn't be in the program okay uh, Hima, uh, you have a, a minute left let me um confirm with mo from the county that that he's aware of what your address is i'm not sure if you mentioned the street name uh mo did you catch the address of this property actually i spoke with this property owner earlier today so I, I'm familiar with the case. Uh, the only thing I can say is my inspector was in the area on the 21st of May, three weeks after the deadline, saw high grass and weed, took the pictures, sent the notice, and this is your call. Okay. Okay, um, very good. Well, uh, Hima, you still have about 25 seconds. Any other uh, comments? Well, uh I, I was thinking maybe can you consider taking us off of the list um, because uh, this is the first time. So you can understand that we usually keep the house, uh, the yard well kept. Uh, and seeing the current year fire problem, we will be extra careful. Uh, okay, well, th thank you very much. Uh, we received your comment uh, and your, your time's up. Um, our next caller is uh, a phone number ending in 0747. Uh, welcome. And you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. We can hear you. Uh, you can begin speaking, caller 0747. Okay, if you are speaking, we actually cannot hear you, um, unfortunately. And so I will need to go on to 
uh, the next speaker. I will come back to you later uh, if you would, uh, if your technical difficulties resolved. Uh, our next speaker is Matthew. Welcome, Matthew. I don't have a last name here. Hello. Hello. All right. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, so I would just like to formally request uh, my my family's property be taken off the list. The address is 698 Miller Avenue. It should be on the last page of that um, of the list of properties. Um, similar to human, uh, human, the previous caller, and that uh, we did also not know about this program that was in existence, although we totally understand due to the fire season and whatnot. Uh, but at that time, when whenever the picture or inspector came, uh, our property, we understood that our grasp was pretty tall. Um, we have already taken the steps, even before we got this notice, that we needed to mow the lawn and to remove all the um, fire risk, um, dried wood or grass or whatnot. And I don't have a picture now, but I could provide on a future, if needed, on a future date. That our property now like has like the the grass has been cut uh, since for a long time now, um, and we would like to request that the property be taken off since at that point it was um, at that point we did not it was it wasn't a good time for us our our um, machine to mow the grass was also broken but we did take steps um, afterwards to mow the lawn and to um, get rid of the long grass. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Uh, Mo, is there any response that you'd like to provide to that at this point? Well, I, I'll say that there's there are some differences between the previous caller and the property that Matthew has, which is uh, parcel 37542011. Uh, you saw the picture that uh, the young woman put up that the grass was green, it was tall, but it was green. Uh, as I looked at the, the photographs, which if I if I can figure out how to do this, I can share them if you'd like. Uh, the photograph that we have for uh, Matthew's property, it's tall and it's dry and it, it is thick. It, it is a much more significant hazard than I think the previous property would have been. Uh, I, I don't think that personally, I, I think that this is a more significant issue than the previous caller. Uh, okay. So that, that would be my position. Okay, thank you, Mo. Uh, Matthew, if you're still on, uh, you still have about 20 seconds if you have anything else you'd like to do. Uh, I just have a follow-up question because uh, when, uh, from the presentation I just saw, like, so if I, if we do, if, the prop, if my property does get onto the payment program, if I do maintain it and make sure, you know, this doesn't happen again, the annual fee gets waived. Am I correct in that? Uh, uh, all right. Well, your, your time is out, but I'll allow the county representative to answer your question, which was if, if, they're, if they're in compliance in the future, does the annual fee get waived? That's a, that was a question for the city. That was a city's decision. I, I, can, I can comment. So as part of the new city process, if the parcel is abated, um, Prior to the April 30 deadline um, of inspection, and um, that could happen any any time between April 30th and the end of October, then that inspection fee will be waived and covered by the city. So um, it'll be waived for the parcel owner. The county will still charge the fee to cover their cost of inspection, but the city will then um, cover that cost. And, and just to be clear, when does that abatement need to happen, Madam City Clerk? Beginning April 30th and through October 31st. Okay, so it needs to be abated by October, uh, by, by uh, April 30th. Right? By April 30th, but it must be maintained because the inspectors could come um, anytime between those um, th during that time, all the way through October 31st. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and, and when would the initial uh, notice come that uh, there is non compliance? Non-compliance initial notice would come in at any time during that window that we saw non-compliance on the property. Okay. We we can be there more than once for any number of reasons, uh, including a call from the city 
code enforcement to look at a property uh, or a report on another property, we may have to be down in that area and see it. So if we were to see it and it was out of compliance, we could send a notice in August that it's out of compliance. An initial non-compliance notice, correct? Well, the initial, yes, it could be an initial non-compliance notice. We could inspect the property in April or in May and it'd be okay, but we may have to go back in June or July and it not be okay at that point, in which case they could still get a non-compliance notice. Okay, okay. Uh, very good. So if you're inspecting in June or July, for instance, um, our city process is such that as long as they are compliant by the following April 30th, is that correct? Until the following October, as long as they're compliant within that window? Or, uh, or just Kirsten, can, Kirsten can correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, if I inspect their property at any time during this year and at no time is it non-compliant, the city covers the cost of the inspection. However, if at any time during that, it's found to be non-compliant, the property owner pays the fee and any additional fees that would be applied with it as well. So the city only covers the cost of the initial inspection if for the entire window of April 30th to the end of October, that property is maintained in a compliant state. Got it. Okay, well, let's go on to our next public speaker. Uh, we have three more hands raised. Our next speaker is Wanling Wen. Welcome. Wanling. Hello. <coughs> uh, we are in the property of 10251 South Tantau Avenue. Cupertino, California, 95014. So because of the COVID-19, um, we are kind of scared to going outside and take care of the weeds. And we also uh, lost our jobs. So it's a lot of difficulty during those times. And so, um, and we are not also um and and we all did do some maintenance. Maybe it's not uh, enough. Uh, would it be okay to uh consider to some uh better resolution like with the uh programs? Uh, okay. Um, very good. Uh, would you care to respond to that, Mo? One zero two five one South Tanto. Yeah, I was uh, just looking at the picture on that as well. Uh, what I'm seeing is a roadside area along a fence line that has high, very dry weeds, uh, again, up against a wooden fence. So it poses a significant risk of fire uh, in late May. So uh, we wouldn't recommend dismissal on this. We would suggest that it stay on the program. Okay. Okay. Um all right, any other uh, comments or questions from Wan Ling? You're still live if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, seeing no further, our next speaker is Theresa. Yep, welcome, Theresa. Welcome, Teresa. You'll need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Hello, uh, everyone. Grateful and thank you so much. Uh, I have lived in this house for 25 years. This is the first time that I got it. And uh, we were sick, three of us. And my son uh, was working uh, two jobs. And uh, it was COVID-19. Nobody came out. And I was scared to death, so I never come out. Now I, I'm fine, you know, after eight months. So kindly help me because I really didn't have any bad record. Uh, so so I, let me pause you there so that our county right. can pull your uh, address. What is your address? Sure, 18880 Pendergast, Cupertino, 95014. Okay, uh, uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting. Are there further uh, comments or questions that you have? 
oh no, uh, you know, this is the first time and, uh, you know, I have lived here 45 years and this house t- 25. This is the first time that we done, you know, please, you know, forgive okay. us. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Theresa. Um, it's grateful, uh, sir. Uh, Mo, any any um, response to 18880 Pendergast? Uh, I'm reviewing the pictures right now, and I'm going to be honest with you. I think that the inspector may have been a little overzealous on this one. Okay. Okay. I okay. would recommend that we that we dismiss the Pendergast property. The, the The grass is not significantly high, and it's completely green. Okay. So it's being watered. It's not posing a significant fire threat. Understood. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let's go on to our uh, next member of the public who is here, Anil Shetty. Uh, welcome, Anil. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, this is uh, property 10281, Johnson Avenue. Um, I'm living in Cupertino for the last uh, 12 years, and that, that same property. Every time, every year, we maintain it properly very well. This is during COVID time. We uh, missed that uh, in uh, March, April time frame. Um, but if you can see now also, if you can come and see, it is well maintained every time. So I just request you to uh, give us a chance. I remove the name from the list. I would really appreciate that. Okay. Um, any uh, commentary from, from Mo? I'm, I'm getting to the photographs on this one. Okay. Um, this is another one where I'm, again, looking at dry grass against a wooden fence. Um, I, I would have difficulty with, uh, with suggesting that it be removed. Okay. Um, so let's, um, uh, there is another hand raised. Um, oh, but uh, Anil, do you have any further comments? Okay, seeing none. Well, uh, I, I I do have another hand raised from someone who's spoken already. Uh, Wenling, you did have a little bit of time left. Did you want to say anything else? I have a connect. I have technical connectivity. I, I'm sorry, you're barely audible. You're gonna have to speak up. Because um, the Connection difficulty. Yeah, we are not, I'm not able to finish. I just wondering what's the conclusion of do I uh, do we get a uh, wave or? Oh, uh, we we did hear your comments. Uh, we'll need to take it back to deliberation as to your particular property, uh, as well as uh, a number of others that have spoken. Um, but if this is just a follow up, uh, we're uh, going to be in the process of deliberation briefly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, So we'll bring it back to council. Uh, There have been, I count, um, I count, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five properties uh, that have been represented by the public commentary. Is there anybody from uh, council that would like to, for the purposes of opening up discussion, uh, bring a motion at this time? And again, I would ask that a motion be brought prior to our discussion. Again, um, a substitute motion could be made as well. Um, If there are no... uh, I'll I'll move to approve uh, the... Well, I guess I'll move to approve the list, but then that's exempt uh, the ones that Mo uh, thinks should be should not be there. I think it was 18880 Arata Way. Uh, Pendergast. I think it was Pendergast. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I searched okay. wrong. Okay. And then there was another one that he think it was still green, right? Uh, I was a, Pendergast. There was Beardsley and then oh, there was the two from the written challenge. 
Oh, right. The two, the one nine one zero six, one nine one six zero, the two managed by Larissa, right? Yes. Do you have the other property number? I only have one. Nine and the, the other one was Mr. Beardsley. I don't, I don't remember his or Bardsley. I don't remember the property I, uh, number off the top of my head. But that's that's clerical, right? Do we need to put that into our motion? Um, no, if, they're coming off the list anyway. Just, they okay, shouldn't they are have been. coming off anyway. So. So right now your recommendation is one eight 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 zero, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so council member. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Chow moves uh, the staff recommendation with two resolutions, uh, with the removal of one eight 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 zero Pendergast, um, with um, a, a reference to the the material uh, for the particular lot number. Uh, would anyone like to second that motion? I'll second, second it. Oop. Okay, I, I heard Councilmember Moore first, uh, so we're going to uh, have that as the official second. Let's bring it back for discussion. Would anyone care to uh, discuss the motion on the table at this point? I don't, I, I do see hands raised. So, Councilmember Willie. Yeah, so I think we just overlooked the the other one, the Hemalotha. 20094 that uh, Mo also said was green and not up against a fence. So I think it's both the 20094 and the 18880 Pendergast that should uh, not, that we should remove <clears throat> from the list. And then the remaining ones, while they're on the list, correct me if I'm wrong, but the city will pay the fee for this year. If it's in compliant from now on, the city will continue to pay it for those two additional years. If it's found to be non-compliant again, then the homeowner is responsible. So I think that's the correct uh, way we set the program up. Okay, I'm seeing nods from our city manager as well as city clerk. Um, can That's someone correct. vocalize the affirmation that of is, that? That is an accurate um, yeah. description. Because because I think that helps those remaining um, uh, residents, you know, that had the Johnson Avenue, the Tantaw Avenue, the Miller Avenue, for which they weren't compliant and Mo felt that there really was a fire hazard uh, dry grass, dry, not green, and up against wood fence of some side, some type. But to allow the resident or to help the residents that because of this in the past, we've said that the city will cover the fee. So even though it'll stay on the list for two additional years, that um, as long as their properties are in compliance, we will c cover that fee. So it helps them to realize we just can't be uh, not allowing the uh, fire danger to be uh, addressed, but that we're trying to uh, make it as, uh, as helpful <clears throat> for the residents of Cupertino, which we were told, uh, I think Saratoga and other communities can all, are also uh, helping the residents out, especially when you hear their <clears throat> uh, difficulties this year of all years, pandemic get repairmen out when uh, you're trying to keep, um, uh, keep safe from, um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Great, but, thank you very much, Council Member Willie. Council Member Moore, you have your hand up next. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Paul. Um, so when I was looking at the, the agenda items, um, the documents, it wasn't really clear to me where it was stated to a person who would get one of these notices that they could have the fees removed. And I just wanted to make sure if, if I missed that, um, that, that it was really clear to the property owners at the start that there was a way for them to um, have those fees dismissed. And 
Also, if we can, uh, given the COVID situation of this year, um, just act with as much uh, leniency as possible, I, I personally would appreciate that, uh, especially because you're looking at people who have economic hardships that and, and emotional responses to everything that happened this year. And I know even for myself, uh, yard work was not really you know, on the top consideration. And uh, yeah, I'm having to redo my own beds because of this, because they got, became in disarray. Uh, and if there was some way with this process, you know, moving forward that we could remove it from council's property by property um, consideration somehow, um, and maybe we want to think about a way to not have this continue to come back to city council uh, about people's conditions of their yards. Uh, I think that that uh, would, would be great. Um, and lastly, I wasn't entirely sure with the, with the $84, if you're on the list and you clean it up that year between April and October, are you on that list for three years? If somebody could just let me know how that is. Thank you. Okay, hey, great. Uh, so three questions from Councilmember Moore. Um, would, would, would staff like to follow up on that first question regarding notice to the public regarding the process uh, of, of the city covering? That, so the letter that was mailed from the city on January 7th did outline the new city process that uh, compliant parcels would have that fee, administrative annual fee waived. Right. And, and who was this letter mailed to on January 7th? It was mailed to all property owners on the list. Okay. And was that in conjunction with notifications or was that a separate mailing? It was, it was in conjunction with um, the, the, it was a letter um, outlining the public hearing date. Um, it also included the general process of the weed abatement program okay. and um as well as that additional guideline. Uh, very good. And then uh, does anyone remember the second question? Because I, I remember it as being a question from Mo, but I don't remember what it was. I apologize for that. I, I First, let me say that that mailing was separate from the mailing that I sent, which may be part of what uh, the council member is looking at. Okay. Our mailings were forwarded uh, in accordance with the health and safety code, What the ugly notice that has all the one inch high letters and that's required by law. Uh, also, this coming to council is also required by law. Uh, we have to bring it to you annually. It's it's not something we can, it's not something that any of us choose. We, we, we're not doing this because we just enjoy coming here and doing this. It, it's a requirement. We have to, you have to approve the program and, and we need that to move forward. Um, the idea about the yard by doing this for, it's not a matter of how the yard looks. It's a matter of whether or not the issues that we see pose a potential fire threat. If a yard is ugly, that's okay. Feedback. Um, so let's. Uh... Okay. You still get feedback from me? Nope. We're good now. Okay. Uh, but but, but let, well, let me move you on because I, I think we've answered the second one. I want to give okay. a fair allocation to everyone. So there was this question about the $84. Uh, if they're compliant in this season, will they be put onto the uh, list for the next year? What's the answer to that? Well, once a property goes on to the program, it's on for until it has either three consecutive years of voluntary compliance or they do a build and landscape in which they remove the risk of the fire hazard and however they build and landscape with the vegetation that, right. that they put in or other land landscaping or hardscaping. Okay, perfect. So those questions answered. I will go on to Vice. Thank you very much, Mo. I'll go on to Vice Mayor Chow, uh, who has her hand raised next. Vice Mayor Chow. Okay. So I guess first is a follow-up for that question. So if they are compliant this year, they it seems like they will still be put on the list for three years, even if the city pays the fee this year. And how about next year? If they are compliant next year, do they still need to pay the fee next year? Or would, could the city request that if they are compliant this year, that's not put them on the list for three years? 
So the city uh, covers the charge every annually. Every year that they're compliant, the city will cover that. Annually. But they will still be on the list for three years. So then my question, and then my question is, can we just remove them if they are compliant this year for the first year? Let's just remove them because like a lot of them said, it's a slip. So why do we want to put them on for three years? I think okay, we let, me, let me ask the question in another way. Data, if, if, if that's just we wanted to do what council, well, what Vice Mayor Chow is suggesting, would we have to legislatively alter that program? That's uh, no, I think I think my understanding is we have the authority right here in this council meeting to say that, okay, this property has been is compliant this year. Let's remove them from the program. I think that's was this meeting for, right? Well, let's that's ask let's ask a uh, representative from the county. Uh, Mo, your understanding mm -hmm. of it. Would there need to be a change in the law if, in effect, we basically took people off after one year? After one year of compliance? Well, it, if you took people off after one year of compliance, could you do it legally? Of course you could. Uh, the problem that you have is, historically speaking, you have people who will do it the first year but not the second year. Where We, we had, see this countywide. Uh, it, people will respond the first time because they got in trouble. Then they don't respond. If you take them off the first year, I can't address them appropriately the next year if they don't behave because they're not on the list. We have to go through this process for us to be able to do anything with them. Will you delay a process for us to be able to maintain a fire safe condition? So y you tie our hands if you do that. Okay, what, Can you what, do it legally? Yes. What empowers you to keep people on the list in the first place for three years, however? There, there is ordinance that places people on the list for three years, correct? Once they are on the list, or is that just part of your policy? That's, that, that's a, a county policy. The state law says that they can be placed on the program indefinitely. I see. Oh, they can be, but they don't have, understood. Okay. No, so we have the choice and we find three years to be People who do it for three consecutive years are consistent. People don't, who don't, we, we see that anyone for one and two years have a tendency to fail okay. after that. Uh, Vice Mayor, any other questions or comments? We have here um, people who have been doing it consistently for 25 years, and they have a slip during this year due to the pandemic. Then the question is, I think we should... Um, not put them on for three years. That's just uh, adding uh, insult to injury, injury. So I think, I hope that if when they are compliant at the end of um, in August, that's consider removing them from the list uh, uh, permanently. I think that if, even if they are non-compliant the next year, of course, then we'll just they will be add back on, then we would know, right? It's not like it's adding anyone's fault. And and because it will be on the list anyway. Okay. Um, and also it's, it, I find that um, it's, uh, I hope that I wish Mo can figure out a way to share his screen. And if not, can we possibly get pictures? It seems there are sometimes uh, we see two properties. One uh, Mo says, okay, that one, it's green, it's okay. The other one, it's too close to fence. But maybe we have examples of what's good, what's bad. That might be helpful for people to to understand, okay, where, why some are tall, the other are tall too, but then one is, uh, one is recommended that should be off the list, another is not. Then another question is, Mo mentioned the, uh, um, the inspector was overzealous on one of the property. Then I wonder whether the inspector might be overzealous on other properties who is on the list, but they didn't come to complain. How do I find out? Okay, briefly, Mo, um, Vice Mayor Chow, you're considerably over your, your initial allocation of time. So okay. let, let, let's entertain that question. Um, so Mo, is it possible that there are other properties on your list that are there that weren't uh, spoken about tonight where the inspector was a bit overzealous? Of course it's possible. But if a person's not contesting, it's a lot of, I, I deal with over 2,000, sometimes 3,000 parcels in a year. 
it, it's difficult for me to go back and, and double check every single parcel that we deal with to see if if the inspector was overzealous on one particular parcel. Uh, I can say that from a technical standpoint on the one I said he was overzealous on, technically it was not compliant. Mm -hmm. Technically. Okay. Looking at it from a standpoint, I still think it didn't necessarily deserve to be tagged, but it was technically not compliant. Okay, got it. So I'm going to go on to Councilmember Way, who hasn't had a chance to speak yet in this uh, first go around. Uh, so, so I suggest we do not um, interfere with the county's program because it's three years, it's the county's um, rules, but we are helping our residents if they are compliant for the next year and the next year, while well, the city is picking up the fees, the inspection fees. So I think we do our part in helping our residents and we let the county decide on, you know, what they need to do. As for inspectors, I think, you know, we all know individual inspectors might have different standards and uh, they, some more strictly adhere to um, you know the, the rules and some more linear so like Mo said he can't go back to you know check everything I think what our city we do is we support our residents with the fees and as long as they're in compliance for the next three years um, you know we'll, we'll pick up the inspection fees so I think that's pretty uh, fair and good practice and so I, I'm suggesting that we do our part and let the county does um, their part. Uh, okay, uh, Council Member Roy, thank you. I will uh, speak briefly um, and uh, after that entertain any other, uh, you know, uh, kind of cleanup comments. But um, I, I think that the balance that we've struck over the course of several years, as I've been on council, is now, uh, is now a wise one. It's a fair one. It's not something that, um, you know, if you're a taxpayer in Cupertino, you necessarily feel super great about it if you've been compliant. Because essentially, a lot of these costs have been distributed over um, the 20,000 households or so, right? Um, but I think that this is an important program. I think that, um, you know, we, we do have a very real uh, phenomenon of, of, uh, of climate change. And uh, there is, uh, there are some years where the rain is very heavy. Uh, the summers are almost invariably very dry, uh, no matter what. Uh, and, and those seasons are getting hotter, they're getting longer. Um, so we really do need to make sure that this program is funded by people who take it seriously. Um, I, I think we made a very compassionate choice after many hours of discussion previously with regard to the city picking it up. At this point, I'm comfortable with where we are. I'm sympathetic to the idea that COVID has created a lot of different um, considerations for people. Some people don't even want to go outside. That's not totally understandable. Um, but again, if they're compliant, going forward, hopefully they get vaccinated, um, you know, uh, during the summer and they uh, maintain compliance, the, the city will pick it up. Um, your neighbors essentially will pick it up. And uh, personally, I'm comfortable with the motion um, by Vice Mayor Chow and um, seconded, I, I apologize, I forget the seconder, it might've been Councilmember Woolley um, that is on the table at this point. So are there any other um, comments prior to taking a vote? Councilmember Woolley. Yeah, so once again, I think I got overlooked on what I said. <clears throat> the Hemalatha 20094, you know, even Mo said that it's probably an overzealous inspector and all things considered. So 20094 and the 18880 should be left off the list. And all the other ones are on the list with the requirements that we've outlined. Uh, okay, well, let, let's bring that back to, to Mo. Uh, so, so Mo, that particular property, um, what I recall you saying is that it is at our discretion. Um, I, I didn't really quite hear the same sort of um, idea that this was not really uh, so much of an issue. But if you care to elaborate at this point, yeah, I remember there was a, the picture of the lawn and the grass. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what was your impression on that? It was long. It was green. Uh, it was it, it was exceptionally long, in my opinion. It was green. Uh, it 
So many of the other ones we looked at were much worse than that I looked at were much worse than that. Of the ones I didn't make a recommendation, I didn't recommend one way or the other on this one. Uh, I said it's up to you. The oh. other ones that I said they were bad. This one I left to you, and the one at on uh, Pendergast I said I didn't think should remain. That was so this is this one was kind of an five, you know, six six and one half dozen of the other. Okay. Um, so Councilmember Willie, at this point, would you like to um, propose a friendly amendment or have your own substitute motion? It sure, seems I'd like just like to have a friendly amendment to also exclude two zero zero nine four. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so who seconded it? Was it was it Yourself, Councilmember Willie, or was it somebody else? Council member, it was Councilmember Moore. Okay, Councilmember Moore, do you accept that friendly amendment? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, any other further comments at this point? Mm -hmm. uh, we have one from Vice Mayor Chow. Vice Mayor Chow. Uh, yeah, so one other question is Mo mentioned that due to the moving to a new database, some properties were still, should be inactive. Uh, is still on the list. So do we have a new list? Because uh, the resolution, because I looked up the first, very first property manager, um, that's supposed, that was there because of inactive uh, data transfer error. And, but that's still in the resolution. So are there other properties in the resolution that should have been inactive list? I am going to have to go through the database with all of the records in there and and verify that and if there are I will send that through to the city clerk to verify any additional removals from the list for that reason but I will go through them personally tomorrow so can we somehow include the the, re, the revised the list in the meeting minutes so that anyone who re, who come to this meeting later have a record of uh, what properties are actually removed from uh, madam city attorney would that be uh advisable and could we tie our motion to that um given the fact that we don't have the list in front of us at this point yeah what i would recommend is a friendly amendment to or what to amend the motion to also remove any properties that the county identifies were erroneously included due to a data transfer error and to be removed as well and then when these properties come and then they won't be on the list that comes back to you for the uh, for the imposition of the fees. And we'll attach that list, that, that newly revised list to the meeting minutes of this meeting, correct? Um, well, yeah. well, well, link to, uh, well, it's a matter of public record. How do we, how do we? Yeah, I, and I think that's almost a question for the city clerk, how they deal we with. Typically, and we often do receive amended lists from the county and we attach that to the, resol to the signed resolution, but I'm happy to add it. Um, as an as an addendum to the council minutes and and i'm okay with with that because the resolution will reference any um or your motion here will reference any amended okay list. should we should we should i identify a date certain by which that that list should be provided um mo do you have any idea of when you could provide that list so we can give comfort to members of the public watching here that's not going to be like in six months or something like that no but i'll need at least a week uh like well, what, what, what will be at the most, I guess, is probably the more. But if, uh, can, can I make a suggestion? <clears throat> Why don't you just do it when, uh, before um, council approves the minutes for this meeting at the following meeting? Okay. Um, so we're on January 19th right now. That actually happens in a couple of weeks, I believe on uh, February 2nd, if uh, I'm remembering the first Tuesday in February correctly. Um, will, yes. Would two weeks be enough, Mo? Yep. To... Yes, it will. Okay. I'll get you a list before before February second. You will have the the amended list. Okay. So I will go ahead and uh, offer that friendly amendment to uh, Vice Mayor Chow's uh, motion, and as stated and discussed by um, City Attorney uh, and City Clerk, our City Manager Mo from the County and, and ourselves. Um, Vice Wait, Mayor Chow, will you I accept that for me? Okay, you I do. Accept the amendment. Great. And uh, Councilmember Moore, do you accept that as the seconder? Yes. 
Okay, very good. Um, let us go ahead and take a vote on the motion on the table here. Uh, Madam City Clerk, if you could conduct the roll call vote. Certainly, Mayor. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Way? Aye. Council Member Willie? Aye. Vice Mayor Chow? Aye. Mayor Paul? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Excellent. Okay, so we are now on item number 15. The subject is municipal code amendments to update the existing mobile vending regulations, including conforming edits to titles five and 13 in the code, adopting new regulations for sidewalk vending in compliance with SB 946. Uh, the application number is MCA-2020-004. The applicant is the city of Cupertino and the location uh, is citywide. This has been uh, continued from December 15th. And do we have a staff report on item number 15? Yes, thank you, Mayor Paul. Albert Salvador, Acting Director, Community Development. Tonight we have Angela Sway, Economic Development Manager, to start our presentation. We also have several other staff members who Angela will introduce who are all available to answer any questions. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Angela. Thank you, Director Salvador. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Angela Sway, Economic Development Manager. Joining me uh, are Jeff Tamura, Associate Planner, Hugh Ghosh, Planning Manager, and Sarah Lucy, uh, Deputy City Attorney. And I will go ahead and share my screen. Uh, this item is to consider amendments uh, to the city's Muni Code to uh, comply with SB 946. And I'll briefly give some background and context um, for the item. So again, uh, the Economic Development Strategic Plan, EDSP, was adopted um, by City Council in October of 2016. Uh, an EDSP is a multi-year plan to strategically position the city and its business environment uh, based on a number of factors, including retail trends um, and opportunities for maximizing the value of the, the community. Uh, so, the motorized mobile vendor uh, regulations was identified as a key issue due to its growing popularity at the time um, and the increased reliance uh, by consumers. And so as part of EDSP initiatives, um, this was a work program uh, that was worked on by staff uh, beginning of fiscal year 2017-2018. Also uh, during this time, um, SB 946 was adopted by the state um, and went into effect on January 1st, 2019. Uh, and this established limitations to local regulations for sidewalk vending, uh, which requires changes to Cupertino's Muni code. And prior to uh, going to planning commission on October 27th, staff has engaged um, residents and businesses uh, through a number of community uh, meetings um, and information posted in the city's business uh, newsletters um, and encouraging feedback uh, directly to me. And so on October 27th, this item did go to Planning Commission. Uh, Planning Commission adopted uh, regulations for sidewalk vending only um, and did not adopt language relating to motorized um, mobile vendor regulations. And then during that meeting, uh, commissioners discussed a number of issues, which included uh, their concerns with regulations were too lenient, um, and they were afraid that it would affect, negatively impact brick and mortar businesses, in, excuse me, in Cupertino, um, already struggling with the pandemic. Um, and then also there were concerns though of regulations being too restrictive uh, which would disallow services, um, you know, up and coming mobile services such as mobile hairdressers, mobile dentists, um, and other uh, similar types of um, businesses. Uh, also during that discussion and during that meeting, other concerns um, included, and, and we, we also discussed uh, the differences between um, what SB 946 allowed and what the current um, city's muni code allowed. Also, we discussed differences between sidewalk and motorized vending. Um, and then there were just questions raised in general as to uh, why 
um, there was a need for regulating um, mobile vending um, and then what type of restrictions. So the conform, um, uh, again, the purpose of the mobile vendors ordinance is to conform with SB 946 um, and, and really to make sure that the city's code um, was consistent in terms of the terms that we've used. Uh, if you look through our Unicode, um, there were terms using solicitor versus peddler, um, and then to be able to establish a process to regulate uh, these type of uses. And then at this point, the goal, um, I'll just cover the SB 946 um, to give you more familiarity. Uh, the, the goal of SB 946 um, sidewalk vending is to provide entrepreneurship opportunities um, and economic development opportunities to a broader range of uh, individuals. Um, and it can contribute to actively uh, create a more dynamic public space. Um, and then also allows uh, the local authority to establish proposed um, regulations in order to ensure objective health and safety uh, and welfare concerns, which would uh, apply to time, place, and manner of sidewalk vending. And so here, uh, just to go over what sidewalk, the different definitions, SB 946 defines sidewalk vendors um, as a person, and as you'll see, these are different depictions um, from a non-motorized conveyance. Um, so again, it could be um, a push cart, um, a pedal driven cart, a showcase or, or, or rack. And then here um, again with SB 946, stationary sidewalk vendor um, is a fixed location, defined period during the day, removes the facility daily or the conveyance daily. A roving sidewalk vendor uh, moves from place to place and stops only to complete the transaction. So um, in that case, it would be like a balloon vendor or someone selling popcorn. If they're moving, then they stop um, to sell to a consumer and then they keep, keep uh, moving along. And again, for um, SB 946, there are some regulations uh, which include under SB 946, cities are not allowed to prohibit sidewalk vending um, or limit the number of vendors or to prohibit roaming sidewalk vendors from exclusively uh, residential areas. Uh, again, not allowed to prohibit stationary sidewalk vendors from parks um, unless there's a concessionaire agreement. So for example, uh, Blackberry Farm, because we do have, uh, the city does um, control and maintain that concession stand, uh, these sidewalk vendors would not be allowed at that particular park. Um, and again, another restriction uh, or what we, the city is not allowed to is to overly restrict hours of operation. Um, but you, you can see that uh, there are some things that the city is allowed to, um, to oversee, Oops, excuse me. Um, and, and again, it's primarily for um, safety and welfare issues for the public um, as well as ADA requirements. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to Jeff Tamura uh, to go over the exact changes of the ordinance and, um, and the, what it reflects. Yes, thank you, Angela. Uh, so kind of just um, piggybacking off of uh, the regulations you touched on, um, I'm gonna be going over some of the uh, draft ordinance language based on SB 946. And if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. And so as, as SB 946 dictates, a local authority uh, cannot restrict sidewalk vendors uh, to operate only in a designated neighborhood or area, except when that restriction is directly related to uh, objective health, safety, or welfare concerns. Uh, and notwithstanding that a city may prohibit stationary sidewalk vendors in areas that are zoned exclusively residential but shall not or cannot prohibit roaming sidewalk vendors. Uh, therefore, as you see on this table, uh, roaming sidewalk vendors are allowed uh, across the board on all sidewalks um, citywide, as well as in parks. Stationary sidewalk vendors are allowed on sidewalks in non-residential zoning districts and only parks uh, if it doesn't already have a concession contract uh, with another party. And um, if a sidewalk vendor enters 
uh, private property, uh, he or she would become a solicitor instead of a sidewalk vendor at that point. Um, and uh, next slide. So SB 946 does allow setting hours of operation provided that they are not overly restrictive uh, in non-residential zones. So to, to that effect, the draft ordinance uh, allows both stationary and roaming sidewalk vendors to operate between the hours of 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., uh, which are the hours of operation uh, allowed by right for businesses in these zoning districts. And roaming sidewalk vendors are allowed in residential districts from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. And these hours coincide with the municipal code's definition of nighttime to daytime hours um, and uh, a 15 minute limit for uh, any location for roaming vendors applies um, to allow for transactions before they, they move along. Next slide, please. So the proposed ordinance is exempt from CEQA under section uh, 15378 because it has no potential for resulting in physical change in the environment, either directly or indirectly. Additionally, it is exempt under section 15061B3 uh, because it can be seen with certainty to have no possibility of a significant effect on the environment. Next slide. Um, in terms of public noticing, uh, staff placed a legal ad in the newspaper. A display ad was placed in the newspaper at least 10 days prior to hearing. The agenda was posted on the city's official notice bulletin board and the item was posted on the city's um, website four days prior to hearing. Next slide. Uh, the rem recommended action is to uh, introduce and conduct the first reading of the draft ordinance uh, and find that the proposed actions are exempt from CEQA. Uh, adopt regulations to allow sidewalk vending in compliance with SB 946 find that the restrictions and requirements contained in the regulations are directly related to objective health, safety, and or public welfare concerns. And uh, next slide, please. Finally, um, to also provide direction for whether uh, draft regulations uh, to allow and or restrict uh, certain motorized mobile vendors uh, be presented at a later time. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Great, thank you very much. Are there any questions from council at this time? Uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions of staff and the presentation. Council member Willie. So I, I think I saw on one of the early slides that the planning commission review had a three to two vote. At the very beginning slides there. That is correct. I can answer that. Uh, Pew Coach Planning Manager. And, um, and the Planning Commission's vote was a three to two on the. There you um, go, three to two yes. vote. And so when I look through the presentation, I'm not really seeing much in the way of con contention. What were uh, the considerations that were uh, causing two of the commissioners to feel? something else was needed to be changed or done. Well, oh, uh, Council Member Willie, um, as, as mentioned earlier, uh, some of the discussion kind of centered around uh, concerns either being too lenient or um, too restrictive um, in regards to mobile vending um, and, and the mobile services. Uh, and, and because SB 946 um, it, the city has to be compliant. Uh, Planning Commission felt comfortable to recommend uh, making sure that the city's muni code was compliant in 946, uh, but they could not um, uh, agree uh, in regards to the motorized portion. And so tonight, though, is only focused on the uh, sidewalk and the final recommendation was to bring back the motorized. So I don't know why they would have a three, two vote. If I may, um, Council Member Willie, Pew Bush again, I just wanted to clarify the Planning Commission's motion to pass, uh, to adopt the regulations for, the motion was to adopt regulations for sidewalk vending only 
and not adopt any regulations for motorized mobile vending. So that was their full motion, and as a result, some uh, uh, planning commissioners uh, were okay with that. Most planning commissioners were okay with that, but a couple of the planning commissioners did not agree that that would be the motion. So the motion still passed, and as a result, the planning commission's uh, recommendation was only to adopt regulations for sidewalk lending, which is what is proposed tonight. Okay. Okay. I, I can understand that. So it wasn't that there was a contention in the uh, recommendations for the sidewalkers tonight. It was a contention as to whether or not to include the motorized vendors. Right. Absolutely. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. Let's go to Council Member Way. Any questions? Council Member? Um, yes. Um, do, do we have any feedback from the business community regarding mobile vendors or even motorized vendors? Angela Sway, Economic De uh, Development Manager. Uh, yes, Council Member Way, during our outreach meetings, uh, some of the concerns that um, were raised, um, you know, again, the, there were businesses or, you know, folks who did participate, um, they recognized mobile vending or um, as a kind of a, definitely a trend, um, something that's out there that is uh, allowed by other cities. Um, and they just wanted to be able to understand what the, um, the process would be um, in order to allow or to regulate uh, these types of vendors. Uh, again, some of the concerns were, um, you know, making sure that they were in compliance, uh, again, being able to provide um, accurate sales tax numbers, um, and then perhaps not being too close to existing brick and mortar uh, businesses. So uh, a number of concerns came up um, in, and from residents, they voiced their concern or their desire to have mobile, um, motorized mobile vendors come to their um, homes, to private property um, and um, be able to provide services, especially during this time of shelter at home, shelter in place. Um, for example, dog grooming, um, they would like to have that surface be available and allowed um, at their homes. Um, and then the, the discussion also grew to, well, then do we allow that on private property or private commercial property? Um, so there, there was a lot of discussion um, and um, those things were raised during these meetings. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Vice Mayor Chow. So, so does the state law require us to allow these uh, main mobile vendors? Uh, it seems the key here is we are adding a registration process so that they are required to register in order to operate in Cupertino. And it seems you didn't really cover the registration process. And I wonder, do you have uh, some slides on that? And uh, how are we going to capture the sales tax? And how and the issues raised uh, by the residents, uh, as Angela said, for example, how do we make sure the the mobile vendors do not compete with existing business? For example, having a coffee sh coffee um, mobile vendor right in front of coffee shop on the sidewalk. How do we prevent that? Do we have that in our proposed regulation? Uh, Vice Mayor, uh, good questions uh, and. There's something, uh, I, I do want to make clear that this, moving forward, this is for sidewalk vendors. So uh, these are not the motorized vendors. Uh, again, Planning Commission only recommended moving forward with adopting um, the sidewalk vending only. Um, and as I mentioned, um, there was a, a picture that I showed. Uh, the conveyance is ones that are mobile and, and non-motorized. Um, and then in regards to um, kind of the regulations or the, the processing, uh, we would be coming, we would work on um, developing that type of, um, I guess it's the, applying for a, a permit or a, um, a registry uh, where the person would have to apply in order to be able to be a sidewalk vendor. Yeah, and I could expand a little bit more on the, the registration process. Um, I, I think right now we are thinking of um, the application itself for mobile vending, uh, as well as a business license uh, and an annual registration fee. Um, uh, part of that application is gonna include uh, 
uh, getting details on the business, so description of the business, what types of uh, goods, uh, foods, or, or where is being uh, sold, the type of vendor, so if that's going to be uh, stationary or roaming, um, their hours in operation, the routes of operation if they are roaming, uh, and location if they are stationary, um, as well as the size and, and the type of facility that's going to be used, uh, and any other type of health permits from the county that may be needed. Uh, in, in regards to your last question, uh, Vice Mayor, um, uh, we, we don't have any uh, uh, draft language right now uh, that addresses uh, a push cart coffee shop that may be within a certain proximity to a, a brick and mortar coffee shop. Um, uh, so that's maybe the it's more like ice cream truck. Maybe not if it's mobile. I mean, not motorized. Maybe more like ice cream truck. But still, it could be in front of an ice cream shop. <laughs> sure. Well, the the ice cream truck wouldn't be covered under under this um, SB nine forty six. Um, so it, it would kind of be uh, a push cart ice cream um, uh, ice cream vendor. Um, so. Yeah, so how how we? I mean, the the regulation is going to have language that says you cannot be. Um, be selling stuff that's similar to existing retail business within a certain feet. Is that going to be have that kind of language, like within um, feet or something? If I may ask a, a, a clarifying question, uh, Council Member Chow, are you talking about the sidewalk vendors or are you talking about the motorized mobile vendors? Sidewalk vendors. So for sidewalk vending, it is my understanding that state law prohibits us from having any standards other than objective standards uh, for health safety reasons. And so such uh, distance uh, for uh, brick and uh, considerations for brick and mortar in, in the fashion that you framed it would not be possible. And we also have uh, Sarah Lucy here, our deputy city attorney, who can help answer uh, or, uh, that question if that was not answered accurately. Oh, not allowed by the state law. I see. Correct. Well, I would, I would also imagine, uh, Vice Mayor, that a person who's selling ice cream in a push cart or a somehow a mo small mobile sidewalk vending uh, cart is going to purposely not be near an ice cream shop, for example, or a like business, so that they can maximize their business. So they'll kind of go out into areas that either don't have that, in particular, residential or um, other commercial areas without like business. That's what I would think. Uh, let me relegate the rest of this over to, um, you know, discussion uh, at this point, since uh, we, we've gone over significantly on this, um, Vice Mayor Chow on your, on your time allocation mm -hmm. for questions. So l let me go to Council Member Moore. Uh, Council Member Moore, you haven't had a chance to ask questions yet. Do you have any um, for, for staff in the presentations at this point? Oh, gosh, I think the the only question that I recall having was uh, making sure that the sidewalk with regards to safety, uh, making sure that the sidewalks would be clear for strollers and bicycles. And if um, perhaps um, someone from staff could ensure that that is going to happen. Um, that was really my only question. Yeah, so the draft ordinance does um uh, allow for a minimum four feet um, unobstructed path to travel um, for for stationary uh, sidewalk vendors. Okay, thank you, Jeff. That's what mm -hmm. I thought. I thought it was four feet, but I couldn't. I was flipping through it and I could not find find it um, for some reason. And I was just hoping uh, if you can locate it for me very quickly. Um, no, I found it. Nine, got it. Good. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much, Councilmember Moore. Um, you know, there there was that um, remaining part of the question from Vice Mayor Chow, so I, I'll, I'll use my time on questions uh, to ask our uh, Deputy City Attorney uh, Sarah Lucy to follow up on uh, Vice Mayor Chow's question. Um, yeah, so I think what what Pew said is right that SB nine forty six basically doesn't allow you to impose a, a restriction that's not directly related to an objective safety, health, or welfare concern. And the statute is pretty uh, 
explicit that economic competition or community animus doesn't count. Um, so, yeah, you 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 couldn't we couldn't impose a limit on you know certain types of businesses within certain distances of each other. Um, that 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 we couldn't justify that. Okay, well, thank you for the, the clarity there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the public hearing. Um, if there are any members of the public that would like to make commentary uh, on this item and the presentation, um, please raise your hand. I do have one hand raised at this time. That is Rick Kitson. Welcome, Rick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members. I simply wanted to say thank you to staff for their work on this issue. And as uh, Angela Sway had mentioned, we have uh, chamber members who are on both sides of this issue. It is a uh, nexus of uh, economic change and changing business models. However, it uh, comes to mind that Cupertino is well known for uh, significant community and regional events. and might be very, very helpful if those events could be deemed time limited uh, concessions so that event organizers could in fact organize and design the event. If you can imagine a cherry blossom festival, fall fest, Diwali, and any of the number, countless other wonderful events that we have in Cupertino, they're bound to happen again and it would be um, a significant disincentive if these were in fact um, just open markets rather than uh, specific events uh, designed for a specific organization. And that's my only comment and concern. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Rick. I don't see any other hands raised uh, from the public at this point. And so that being the case, I will go ahead and close the public hearing on this item and bring it back to council. Uh, at this point, I'll entertain a motion for discussion purposes. Okay, I'll make the move. I'll move that ordinance number 21-2220 be read by title only and that the city clerk's reading constitute the first reading thereof. I see. Second. Okay. Um, would you like to add in your motion, Council Member Way, that you find that the proposed actions are exempt from CEQA, that you adopt the regulations to allow sidewalk vending and compliance with SB 946, and that you find that the requirements contained in the regulations are directly related to objective health, safety, and our public welfare concerns? Okay, I thought that's. Um the city clerk will read that. It's not that, that the case, so I should. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just um, adding the points that were in the recommended action. Uh, sure, so, okay. I'll accept. Is that a friendly amendment? That's a friendly amendment. Okay, I'll accept your friendly amendment. And Councilor Moore, as a second. Second, and I just want to clarify because we we and probably all of us got this in the mail uh, today from the for the council members. And it's a very, it shows a very brief uh, first reading, which is, which is exactly what council member way stated. But um, I, I see that you've added on um, the extra language from the staff recommendation. Uh, so perhaps, you know, we can talk offline about how to um, properly have those items stated. Yeah. I, I mean, what was throwing me off was the first sub item with regard to the proposed actions being exempt from CEQA. My experience in the past has been that we would want to specifically articulate that. And then I just kept going with points B and C. Um, but you know, I, I think at the end of it, you know, there's no harm in it. So, um, but, but point well taken. And um, well, yeah, I didn't that, yeah, I, I just received that uh, card that you're referencing in the mail as well a while back. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Let, yeah, you're welcome. Let, let us go ahead and open it up for discussion. Vice Mayor Chow has her hand raised. Uh, I'd like to propose a friendly amendment uh, for the second part of the staff recommendation um, that we, the staff bring back proposal to regulate motorized vendors um, in this year. 
Um, okay, let us, let us, let us, okay. Uh, let, us, let us consider the motion that's on the table right now. Um, and that actually is the second part of the recommended action. I, I see that as a distinctly different um, item. However, if you would like to try to add it to council member Way's motion, uh, that, that's certainly possible to do, I think. I just uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Madam City Mayor. I, I think we can provide direction as well as have essentially the first reading of an ordinance in one motion. Or would it be cleaner? Yes, you're, you're nodding yes. I think you can combine the two, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so Council Member Way, will you, will you accept that friendly amendment to add the second part of the recommended action to your motion? And the exact words of the second part is to delay consideration motorized mobile service until a later date. I don't know. Provide not direction delayed. to staff to bring it back to us. At a, not to delay it. We're not considering it tonight. Not delay yes. because we don't have any proposal yet. So bring back a proposal to regulate motorized vendors. Uh, do we want to put a date or just that? In the next uh, fiscal year, I think. That's a pro recommendation is as a work program item for next fiscal year. Uh, sure. I'll, I'll accept that. Okay, I see uh, Councilmember Moore shaking her head. Yeah, I, are you not going to uh, accept may, that? Maybe it's easier to separate it. Uh, Councilmember Moore, you'll need to unmute yourself in order to respond. I am unmuted. Thank you. Okay, so the the, the problem I have with this amendment is that we are we are asking staff to do something. I don't understand how it is that we're going to come to a an agreement about what they are to bring back because from the planning commission um, and there, there was um, it was, became a kind, kind of a contentious issue, um, whether you were going to protect the, the business owners that are here in Cupertino, how many, mo what types of mobile vendors you're going to have when they're allowed to be here, it becomes very, very complex very quickly. So if you're saying that you're going to direct staff to come back, we're going to have to have a whole discussion about I what we're going to discuss, have to direct them Suppose to do. we'll start back. with a study session so we can discuss all that which we haven't had a chance to, right? That's the process, right? Usually we'll have a stop session, a study session to... Mayor Paul? No, I, I thought I heard that in um, uh, Vice Mayor Chow's um, friendly amendment to propose a study session. Is that is that palatable to you, Councilmember Moore, as part of a process? I don't understand why we need to uh, do this in this fashion, uh, why it couldn't remain for the, the first part uh, that we're going to pass through. Um, okay, that's totally fine. So, so I mean, it's, it's, it's prerogative to decline to um, accept the friendly amendment as the seconder. So uh, is that what you're doing? I, I just want to clarify that. You're declining to accept the friendly amendment as the seconder of the original motion. Okay, I w yes, I was the seconder on the first. Yeah, correct, I declined to accept okay. Okay, so right now on the table, we have the original motion uh, with, you know, my, my friendly amendment, as well as, I believe, another friendly amendment. Um, uh, but that friendly amendment from Vice Mayor Chow has been declined as a seconder. Uh, Vice Mayor Chow, at this point, do you want to do anything else procedurally? Um, you know, not, not to make suggestions, uh, but, you know. So, I, so should I bring this as a... Um a motion after the first motion? Yeah, I would, I would suggest I that. I, I think sequentially is probably a better way to do it. I mean, hmm. no. Okay. Because I don't want to vote on this first, so this, I cannot say this is a... I'm sorry, are you, are oh, you no. saying you don't, I mean, you don't want to vote on the motion on the table first, or you no, do? No, I mean, I don't want to vote on the second portion. Oh, got it. Okay, I'm going to agree with you. Right. I, I, I was going to say that yeah. your option is perhaps a substitute motion, but that doesn't sound like that's what you want to do. So let's uh, let's call the question, if there are no other comments on the motion on the table, I don't see anyone's, uh, other people's hands raised. Uh, Vice Mayor Chow and, and, and mm -hmm. Council Member Moore, your hands are still raised, but... Yeah. I'm assuming that that's an artifact of our last discussion. Um, so, um, Madam City Clerk, if you could conduct a roll call vote on the motion on the table. And would you like me to read, conduct the first reading? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, please conduct the first reading of 21-2220 and uh, conduct a roll call vote on the motion. This is the first reading of ordinance number 21-2220, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Cupertino amending chapter 5.04, 
business licenses generally. Chapter 5.20, solicitors, chap solicitors, chapter 5.48, mobile vendors, and chapter 13.04, parks. And I will conduct the roll call. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Way? Aye. Council Member Willie? Aye. Vice Mayor Chow? Aye. Mayor Paul? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Excellent. So now, um, so now do I Chow, did you want to introduce your motion? Yeah, so I would like to move that we ask the staff to bring back an item. Maybe could, I mean, not proposal, I guess, but maybe a study session on motorized vendors. I think this right because right now our, in our regulation it's not it's not allowed anywhere in Cupertino unless it's a special event. So uh, usually I see that in office um, parks there are not only food trucks there might be um, car oil change and dental dental services that's provided. And right now that would not be allowed. And I think people are doing that illegally. And as I understand also, if we allow that, we do capture the sales tax through the county. So I think um, that's something we should consider um, to regulate, consider whether it benefits us or not. Okay, let's, let, let's, let's hold your discussion on the motion until we can get a second. Um, uh, is there a second on Vice Mayor Chow's motion? For the purposes of discussion, all second. Okay, excellent. So, um, Vice Mayor Chow motions and um, Councilmember Willie seconds to bring back mobile vending as a, a study session item. Uh, any discussion? Uh, please, please raise your hands if you would like to discuss this particular uh, motion. Uh, I, I see Councilmember Moore. Your hand is raised, Councilmember Moore. Yes, I, I agree with bringing it back as a study session, um, and, but I am troubled that it was uh, advertised in a certain way. So I would prefer it to be more neutrally suggested. Okay, um, any other comments? Any other comments? Uh, Council Member Roy? Yes, I have a question. Um, the motorized mobile vendor is not regulated by SB 946, right? SB 946 is just for um, the other part. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, very good. Any other comments, Vice Mayor Chow or Council Member Willey? Okay, I'll, I'll comment on this. I am fine with bringing you back uh, for study session. Um, I would like to ask a quick question of uh, our fellow council member Moore at this point. Council member Moore, was this part of planning commission when you were on planning commission? He, um, yes. Uh, okay. So Mayor Paul, one of the things that I found was really confusing when it, when both items came together um, was that we were talking about, and, and as you're kind of seeing that, in some of the questions that you're you're hearing, um, that it became confusing. Mobile vendors, mobile vendor on a sidewalk, mobile vendor in the street. What kind of mobile vendors in a street? Is it a service provider, food truck, um, something like that? And and then you had vehicles coming to the home. It it got all very very confusing pretty fast. And then there was some contention about uh, the mobile vendors in the street. So I felt that it would be easier for us to talk about each part separately. What were the specific requirements of SB 946? And let's adhere to those, tweak it where we can, do what we could with it, and then look at the um, mobile trucks, mobile vehicles separately and deal with you know whatever push and pull was going on in the community about that at, at another time. Okay, understood. Um, so, so planning did hear this and um, they, they, they did, uh, push forward a certain set of recommendations. So um, my comment on this would be, I, I'll be supportive of a study session uh, to come back to their council. I think probably 60 minutes. Um, if there's a desire for an hour and a half, uh, let me know. But um, Vice Mayor Chow has her hand raised as well. Uh, sorry, this is a question actually regarding the sidewalk vendor. We are talking about sidewalks. How is that a the adopted ordinance, does that allow it inside the park or for example, inside the city hall plaza? 
uh, is that included? And okay, I'll allow the I'll allow the question really briefly since it's yeah. pertinent to our okay. motion. Okay, let's bring this to staff uh, to answer for the for if their questions specifically to that. Yes, okay. it does. It, it does allow um, vendors sidewalk uh, vendors on on public parks. Okay, very good. Uh, so let us go ahead and, um, and and call a question for the motion on the table. Madam City Clerk, can you please conduct a roll call vote? Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Way? Aye. Councilmember Willie? Aye. Vice Mayor Chow? Aye. Mayor Paul? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, very good. Uh, item number 15 is concluded. Item number 16 was postponed until March 16th. And now we're on ordinances and action items. Uh, item number 17, the subject is to approve the updated commissioner handbook. I would, um, yeah, I, I, I would ask just as a, a point going forward that we, we modify the language for our subjects uh, to acknowledge the fact that we're under consideration here. Uh, so the subject should be consideration approval uh, of the updated commissioner handbook. It's just, it, it's a nicety, but I think it's an important point to make going forward. So um, is there a, uh, a staff uh, report on this subject, on this item? Yes, good evening, honorable mayor and council members, Katie Namura, assistant to the city manager uh, to present the update to the handbook. Let me share my screen. So the handbook is a guide for commissioners and it's provided to them at their orientation after their appointment um, and is a reference guide for basic protocols and requirements. And as part of the work program this year, uh, council requested that staff bring forward an updated uh, commissioner's handbook due to the fact that in the past, the commissioner's handbook has not actually gone to council for approval uh, and also to improve readability uh, to make sure that it gets um, more heavily used uh, throughout the commissioners. So in our update, we shortened it from 32 pages to 10 pages in an effort to make it uh, readable, um, easy to find the information you're looking for. And of course, as always, the city clerk and their liaison are available as resources to them. We also added uh, at the end, several links to additional resources if they should need them. Um, and we also incorporated relevant recommendations that came from council and were adopted uh, in January that improved commission engagement and standardized protocols. To gather feedback from commissions, we held a joint commission meeting on November 30th, and those comments can be found in attachment A. Uh, many commissioners voiced that this was a more user-friendly document and that they felt uh, excited that they would actually read it, so that was good to hear. Um, we did make some adjustments for clarity that are outlined in the staff report. Uh, there were a couple commissioners that expressed concerns regarding too many periodic written updates. Um, I believe there's kind of the update for the uh, progress on the work program, the updates to the three items they're working on on the website, and perhaps a couple other places. Uh, also, there were actually a lot of questions regarding Brown Act and Rosenbergs um, that will be addressed in training that will be coming up this year and we will be implementing that annually from here on forward. So that's the idea. We made this document more of a guiding document to get them initially, here are the things you should be aware of uh, that will be supplemented with additional training uh, to help uh, guide them. And so we recommend that council approve the updated commissioner handbook and provide any input. That concludes my presentation. Great, thank you, Katie. Are there any questions from council? I don't see any hands raised. I'll bring it to the public at this point. Are there any members of the public in attendance that would like to comment on item number 17? Okay, uh, there are no members of the public with their hands raised. I will bring it back to council for a motion uh, prior to discussion is there a motion to um, adopt the recommended action to approve the updated commissioner handbook and provide any input? 
Yes. <clears throat> I move that we approve the updated uh, commission, commissioner handbook. Um, okay. Uh, hey, and is, oh. is there a second to the motion? Second. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Willie motions and Vice Mayor Chow seconds to uh, approve the updated commissioner handbook. And are there any comments on this? Okay, as, as we're, um, okay, Council Member Moore. Um, I attended the all commissions meeting and I really appreciated the changes that were made. Um, but in particular, it was really great to have representatives across all the commissions in a meeting together. And uh, to my knowledge, that hasn't happened in a couple of years. So um, if there is something of substance for the commission, the commissions to um, get together on, maybe do this every two years or something, go over the handbook or um, discuss some issues that uh, commissioners are finding that they have in common. Um, I think that could help. And it was just, it was just really great to have us all together on one meeting. And uh, I thought the handbook, the, the new one was, was great. And the links were really helpful too. Thank you, uh, Council Member Moore. Uh, are there any other comments from council on this item? Um, I spent Okay, yeah, thank you. It's a really much readable version. <laughs> thank you, Katie, Katie, for all the effort. I do have some question. So one thing is about the city work program. So the way it's written right now, it says um, prior to the first draft of the city work program each year, the staff will reach out to commissions to ask for recommendations of items to add. These recommendations will be provided to the city council for consideration. But ultimately, the city council will determine the final items. It's a little unsure what's the process because prior to the first draft of the work pro program, that's already in March. And that's already when the council already prioritized the items. And, and then, so when, how would the commissioners be reached out to submit items. Because right. so council, we, we, is, council goal setting is the end of January, right? Shouldn't they submit the, the items for council to consider even before January? Right, so we make sure that uh, we gather information on their input and ideas prior to the council ever seeing um, the draft of the work program. So that's prior to the, uh, the actual adoption, because if you recall, uh, we usually have a study session or a special meeting just to review the work program. And when that work that draft work program comes to you just to discuss and possibly reprioritize, um, that is when you receive the commission's recommendations. So it's it is during that process. It's not, we give them to you prior to it going to council for adoption. Um, we so typically will gather their input in December and January. That's that's how so it happened great. last time. Yeah, yeah, that's why here it's not clear. Here it feels like they they won't be reached out in December. We didn't specify which month because it could vary by commission. It could also vary depending on how our strategic planning but, process goes each year, but we make sure that we have their input for you when you are reviewing that draft. I guess I kind of feel like I hope to get the commission input before the council goal setting. So that when we set our goals, we have some input from commissioners. Otherwise, I feel like every time um, we set our goals, it's like five council members with just whatever on top of our head. And then we set a goal. Commissioners submit something else we didn't consider. And oh, maybe, maybe we just maybe have a vernacular. Maybe something we <clears throat> might be like, oh, that's something I would even prefer better. So I think maybe we're, we're changing words. So you have... The, the council has set five goals. They're long-term goals, and they don't really change from year to year. If you're talking about strategic projects, goal. please let me yeah. finish. Okay. If you're talking about the projects that go underneath each goal, that is what each of the commissioners input into prior to council considering all the items for the work program. That's how we did it in the first strategic planning process that we conducted when mm -hmm. I... Got so there will be a council goal settings 
for the council to propose project. So those are those are kind of separate activities in the same thing. Your goals, you set your goals. The we we'll, you'll confirm your goals every year, but they're not goals. Not just change. strategic pro goals, not project. Correct. Right. And then underneath there, you have projects that support your goals. So when throughout. the council propose uh, project goals, for example, like the motorized vendor, maybe we didn't discuss today. Maybe it's something I want to bring up. When the council should bring that item? It, well, in the, the past, staff, it was a January goal setting, and that's not there anymore. No, it will be. It's the same. It's the same strategic planning process I gave you last time. That's how you'll do it this time. Only I'm hesitating because I've talked to each one of you about this current work program that we're in and how heavy it is with COVID. So what I'm trying to tell you is we will do an abbreviated process, but you'll still have an opportunity to see and provide input. And then my question is, we don't have an input from the commissioners before our goal setting. You before your project setting, because you will. This yeah. is the, you know, it's only prior to the first draft of city work program. That usually is when a lot of things are already settled. I guess I'm not understanding what you're saying then, because we we've done it. Okay. That first well, one that I said, you you actually see commissioners input. Yeah, so let me let me interject yeah, that's, that's uh, okay. yeah. on, uh, a fair amount of time. So let, let me um, uh, and and I don't want to um, shortchange the uh, amount of work that we did collectively here. Um, so so Vice Mayor Chow and uh, the city manager as well as Katie, uh, over the course of 2019, um, we we met. I think it was at least a dozen times, and these were very pithy meetings. Uh, they were not easy to go through at all. We came um, up with a set of subcommittee recommendations. Um, I pulled that. The subcommittee recommendations are included in uh, today's meeting materials. Um, I'm looking at page four, and I and as I read it, I remember that we did deliberately um, keep that uh, not specified as to date. And so item number 30, um, staff will reach out, this is the last sentence of it, staff Staff will reach out to the commissions and audit committee prior to the first draft of the city work program to ask for recommendations of items to add. And so in my understanding is that last year was really kind of the first year that we had the opportunity to do that because we didn't really approve these uh, subcommittee recommendations until uh, late in the fall of 2019. However, last year was very unusual. Um, it, it was actually you know pretty pretty quick. Um, and so my expectation was always that this is the first full year that we would have had to be able to um, implement the subcommittee recommendations. Of course, last year was highly unusual um, and we've had to allocate bandwidth to a, a number of different items. But you know, personally, I'm satisfied that we do have a staff that is in alignment with what we talked about over many, many hours in 2019. And um, you know th this particular sentence that I'm reading that's pertinent to your concern right now, Vice Mayor Chow, I, I do remember that we were wanting to impart a certain degree of flexibility in terms of saying, look, you know, you, you need to reach out to the commissions prior. Um, and, and I would, you know, recommend that we go back to uh, this set of subcommittee recommendations because they were just so thoughtfully rendered. Um, and, and there are other aspects of it that will that do speak to what your concerns are. And, and I'm not just trying to, you know, say to, to you in, in any kind of way to mollify your, your concerns or try to abbreviate, you know, um, the, 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 the length of, of your commentary. I, I'm also saying to, to staff, um, you know, we did say on a quarterly basis, we're gonna visit this. We did say on, on the spreadsheet that we have for the work program, put in an extra column, the commissions and committees, you know, we can identify possible synergies over the course of the year. So I think this is a this is a really good document, um, and, and so I just I just commend it to uh, all of us, and I just recommend that uh, we remind ourselves uh, of the work that we did over the time there. Uh, at this point, however, Vice Mayor Chow, since you have had a, a good amount of time, let, let me let me get to the can other, com the, the other council members. Okay. Let me get to the other council members. I'll come back to you uh, if anybody okay. else wants to make a comment at this point with regard to the motion that's on the table. 
I'll, pro I'll write up an edit and propose it later because right now it's written from the point of, of, of view of the staff, not from the point of view of the commissioners. Okay, so what, what are you saying? That the, the handbook is written from the point of view of the staff? This or? paragraph is prior to first draft, the city staff would reach out to commissioner. This okay. is written from the point of view of the staff. Okay, I, I understand. I would like to know when I will be proposing up items. That will be in December. This is something that commissioners should know. So I'll write something up. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I, I want to also remind you that, you know, prior to our efforts, there really wasn't cohesion among our, our various commissions and the audit committee in yeah. terms of, you know, trying to, to, trying to keep in sync with uh, the council and the idea that we do have advisory, you know, bodies here uh, that, that, that I think would be optimized in terms of, you know, their productivity and uh, the various ways in which, you know, the, the different groups, you know, conduct their business, um, but could really use some, some guidance as to, you know, just set procedure, just as a basic procedural rules as to, you know, when is the work plan defined? How does it, you know, kind of relate vis-a-vis -vis to what council is doing? Um, and, and so having been on a commission for seven years prior to council, you know, I, I definitely appreciate the work that you put into, um, you know, kind of thinking about how this works, but on the ground level, I mean, I absolutely agree. I mean, as a Parks and Rec Commissioner for seven years, I often didn't really have a strong sense of, you know, how does this fit into the council work plan and how does it relate to other things that are going on in the city as well. So, um, but let me go on to uh, any other council members that wish to make comments on the motion on the table. Okay, I, I see no raised hands. So Vice Mayor, if you would like to uh, continue on your comments, um, you know, please, you know, feel free. I, I see the uh, the city manager has her hand raised. Would you like to make a comment at this point? Yeah, I'll just remind you also that we also, for the very first time last year, published that flow diagram. So not only does council, but commissioners know exactly which step we're in and when they're going to be consulted for input. So mm -hmm. this is this is simply, if if you recall, the original reason that the subcommittee was formed and put this together when I first came in was to communicate expectations of council's expectations of commissioners and provide them some guidance. Right. This is not the whole document that incorporates how this process works or how this process works. It's a codependent document, right? So that's what I would say. Each document needs to stand alone. And in this case, the flexibility part that you're talking about, Mr. Mayor, with regard to either December or a lack of discussion on the timing would be then pointed to the strategic planning process for that particular year. Let's say we had to shift it for, for some reason, or the last thing we want to do is then go back to say we're not in, by, in um, compliance with the document we just put in, or that we have to go and change it. That's why originally there was some flexibility put in there about this period of time commissioners would be consulted by staff to provide their input into this giant process that starts, you know, in step A. Just, you know, there's other, there's okay. other companion yeah. documents that we're using. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Chow, you have your hand raised. Oh, yeah. Okay. So for that paragraph, I'm thinking um, it, should, it should read like this. City Council approves an annual city work program to guide the work of the city. The commissions will propose recommendations for the work program, um, maybe by a certain time. These recommendations from commissions will be incorporated to the first draft of the city work program each year. And then, of course, ultimately, the city council will determine the final items of the city work program. It should be something like this, because the, the right now, the way it's read, read right now, it's for the staff. The staff will reach out, will do this. It's not the commissioners. How would the commissioner know when? So they, are, they know they have a role in the city work program. They can re provide recommendation. And this, okay, this, is, this is what I can do. I, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, I need to cut you off here because I, I just, let's not get into elaboration and justifications here. Um, because I, I think we know what your point is. Um, I can propose as a friendly amendment, the language that you recited, and then the city clerk can go back and capture that language with the exception of when you muttered maybe by a certain time. I don't think that language should be inside of the handbook because it's just 
an ellipsis, okay? Um, I, I would propose that we not identify a, a particular time this mm -hmm. year. If we feel like after an iteration, after a year even, but personally, after a couple of years, um, you know, we uh, need to identify a time in order to kind of keep to a particular schedule, uh, fine, you know, let's go ahead and do that. I will propose as a friendly amendment, the language that you proposed uh, a moment ago uh, without the, maybe by a certain time part. Um, good. So will you accept can, that? Can I just have a clarification point? It sounded also like you changed the sentence where these recommendations will be provided to the city council for consideration. You wanted to change that portion? I didn't know. No, she she read that sentence. She oh, read that so sentence. I'll I'll share screen. Um, I'll oh, why, share why screen. do you do that? Because it's probably yeah, I'll share screen later. But there there is another item. Okay, there is another that uh, right now the language on page nine. It's a uh, it says if you meet with any individual outside of the public meeting you should disclose the content of that meeting in the public meeting to again ensure that everybody is aware of the facts and have similar information upon which to base their decision. This kind of requirement is usually necessary. The extra ex parte communication, a term I learned the first year I was on the council, is only required when we are making quasi-judicial decisions because usually we have a lot of communication with other people. The item may or may not be on agenda in the future. And usually when it's a policy decision, so many discussions, I could not possibly capture everything I've discussed with others. So this requirement to disclose extra parte communication usually is required only for quasi-judicial matters. And now we are adding this, that we are requiring this for every issue. I wonder how do we implement that? Uh, where, where, where are you? Uh, uh, page nine. And, and what sub point, what paragraph? Um, it's a second, it's a first paragraph, just first, first page nine, the first paragraph. It's part of a continuation of a, from last page. It's under meetings, section I J. I see, you're talking about the first full a sentence. draft commission, yeah, the, the first full sentence. Uh, and so what are you proposing, that we delete that? If you meet with any individuals outside of the public meeting, you should disclose the content of that meeting in the public meeting to again ensure that everybody is aware of the facts and have similar information upon which to base their decision. Are you, are you suggesting that we delete that sentence? If we like, we could remind them. I think in the original handbook, uh, we do require that they, they do this for extra, for, for quasi judicial ma ma matters. Because uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not getting an answer here. Do you, do you want to delete it? What do you want to do? Well, what do you suggest? I want to clarify this is required only for quasi judicial matters. Okay. So you're thinking about. If, if, if we are. If we don't clarify that, then I would like to, us to clarify how are we going to ask people to, to disclose this information. Okay, first full sentence on page nine, would adding the phrase for quasi-judicial matters in front of that sentence uh, work? I, I wanna check in with the city attorney on that. Is that consistent with your understanding of, uh, of the requirements for disclosure? the legal requirements yeah. for disclosure. Right, I, I, we could add a sentence at the end that says this is required for quasi-judicial hearings or for hearings on quasi-judicial matters. I think the idea was that if, if even okay. for legislative matters, if, if people are gaining facts that aren't in the record, they, they should disclose them, but it's not required. I, I think adding the sentence saying that this is required for quasi-judicial matters at the end of that, paragraph makes sense because then it actually it actually imparts uh, a degree of optionality to the prior sentence um, right because it basically yeah. says this is something you should do and you should still do it because it's an open communication yeah. but in terms yeah. of something you have to do here's where you have to do it is it yeah. is that 
Yep, I agree. Yeah, okay. because otherwise it's impractical. How do I disclose everything I've ever talked about anyone about? Okay, okay, let's 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 right? just please, you know, once we put a punctuation on it, let's let's okay. Okay. So so for that paragraph, um, you're proposing that we add the sentence for quasi judicial matters, uh, this disclosure is requirement. Um, and, and perhaps instead of opening up a new um, sentence uh, to make it clear at the end of that sentence, make it a semicolon and then for quasi judicial matters, this disclosure is a requirement. Okay. Um, oh, and someone is very helpfully putting this up on the screen. All right. Um, so for, quasi, this, for quasi judicial matters, Okay, this is required for quasi-judicial. Quasi okay, good, 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 good. Though, what, how, you, how you had it was great. Whoever is typing that. Is that, is that Katie? Yeah, okay, great. Yes. All right, um, are you okay now, Vice Mayor Chow, in terms of the modifications with regard to draft handbook? And I will, I will say, you know, I think we need to close this um, if there's, if there, are, if there are, if you have a litany of nagging concerns, um, I, I would say, you know, let, let's let's get these modified uh, that you've already uh, identified, and then find a next iteration because I think a, a fair amount of work has gone into this, and we can, you know, pick it up in the next season uh, to to see what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, well, I'm gonna go on to Council Member Way, who has her okay. hand raised. Council Member Moore also has her hand raised. But Council Member Way. I just wanna comment that this is very good process because um, you know commissioners now can be trained, that they need training. And I, I do have, um, I think the staff initiates and for uh, commissioners to have input on the right time and so that we could, they can meet before the council decides on the projects is really good because you have to think about commissioners might coming um, half time, ha halfway through it. So I really think we put staff in, in, in taking care of um, this procedure is really good. I, I kind of think the first amendment is a little it's not as um, clear as what can be done because you, you have to remember commissioners, they, if they're new, they're, they, they've been there just one to two years they, or they coming halfway, it's hard for them to know the timing. So I really think the, um, the original language is really good. That, that's just my comment. Okay. Um, and, and how do you think about the second modification council member way? Is that I'm okay with that, but I think people want to ask people will, even I have to ask what's quasi judicial. Well, I, yeah, matters. I think okay. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so yeah. Councilmember Moore, uh, you have your hand raised as well. Okay, so I heard the word uh, will be incorporated. The words will be incorporated on the first amendment. I disagree with that. The second one, uh, it just felt like this the, this process was running on far past the five minutes we were supposed to have. So I, I hope that I'm allowed uh, a great deal of time um, should I want to pick through uh, an ordinance in the future and go line by line. I hope that you indulge, indulge me on that as well. So I would like to see the original language and the change on the second part. And, and frankly, it just read like, a, a, a step away from transparency, which we want. So you might have a, a commission which is talking about a trail, for instance, and people who are coming to that meeting might wanna know who each one of those commissioners had spoken to and who are they're being influenced by when they're making their decisions about that, that item. So that's where I'm coming from. So will staff please tell me what the, the changes are here? Okay, um, so procedurally, um, the the seconder of the motion did not uh, accept any friendly amendments, and for that matter, um, the original motioner didn't accept the friendly amendment to the extent that the second uh, change was uh, was uh, what was suggested. And so, um, you know, in in an effort to achieve consensus here. What I will do is I'll, I'll withdraw that original friendly amendment and I'll ask the motioner, which I believe was that Vice Mayor Chow or was it somebody else? Uh, Madam City Clerk, who made the motion? Who seconded? It was Willie and Chow. Okay, 
Um, mm -hmm. Council member, will, he, will you accept a friendly amendment uh, to make the modification of the last sentence on page nine um, uh, of the, of the uh, draft commissioner's handbook uh, as we had placed it on the screen? And that that's the only, only change in this friendly amendment. Yes, I'll accept that. And um, was the Vice Mayor Chow as a seconder? Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor Chow, yeah. will you accept that as a friendly amendment? So you mean the, the one about the work program? Um, the, the one about, um, uh, about your quasi-judicial comment. Oh, uh, the quasi-judicial comments. Yeah. Mean, so right now we are adding quasi-judicial comment. But please, uh, yeah. The, the modification, yes. Uh, yeah, but please add a footnote to what's quasi-judicial matters. Uh, no, I'm, look, you know, Vice Mayor Chow, you can't change these friendly amendments as we're kind of in midstream. So, uh, okay. so, so, so can you accept it as a second on the, the sentence that we put uh, on the screen there? If okay. you want to make another friendly amendment, fine. Uh, you, you know, but in terms of, you know, kind of offhand saying, you know, let's add another footnote. We don't have that. Okay. Content. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Great. So right now we have a motion on the table. Uh, it's the commissioner's handbook as 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 provided to the public, um, and it does have this this one modification on page nine, at the top of page nine. Um, now, um, Vice Mayor Chow is asking for. A footnote to be dropped uh, with regard to what a quasi-judicial um, process is. Is that something that uh, we could add? Uh, Madam City Attorney, do you, do you feel that you could provide that kind of uh, definition? I believe we have that somewhere already. Maybe I'll ask Katie Nomura to... But I don't know, was, that, was that in the commissioner's handbook or was that, was that in our subcommittee recommendations? So it's in, um, we have an additional resource for the commissioner's handbook of online policies and other resources. And we do have imposed restraints in which we do define what a quasi-judicial matter is. Okay, so how, about, how about you drop a footnote and you reference that document uh, and, 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 and refer people to that. Is that, is that acceptable, Vice Mayor Chow, in your, your mind? So, yeah, so we're keeping consistent. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Council Member Willie, as the uh, original motion maker, will you accept that as a friendly amendment? Yes. And just formally, Vice Mayor Chow, do you accept that as a? Uh, yes. Okay, a friendly amendment. Okay, great. So we have a motion on the table. I would ask that we vote on this. Um, and I, I think I think we should kind of look at this as the journey of a thousand miles. We've gone 999.9 .9 miles. Let's not get stuck, you know, interminably at the very end. Um, because we, there are years ahead of us. I mean, we can we can we can modify this later as well. Um, that that's what I ask, and, and so the, by by way of that, I'm just asking that we call a question. Um, can we can we still vote on this amendment first? The city work program. The city. Oh, whose whose screen is this? I'm sorry. This is my. So the first one is the original paragraph. That shows the first draft of the. City uh, work program that prior to the first draft, staff would reach out to the commissions. I, I'm modifying that to read the commissions will propose recommendations for the work program to be incorporated in the first draft of the city work program each year. Okay, I was hearing from council, uh, or at least a couple of council members, that they didn't have the appetite for this particular language. Um, and I think it was the second sentence that you have highlighted here. The recommendations from commissions will be incorporated to the first draft of the city work program each year. Um, so, mm. uh, raise your hands, uh, Council Member Way. Will be have, considered, I guess, not not totally uh, incorporated. Uh, okay, Council Member Way. Um, yes, I I still think the original language is good, and uh, because we simply cannot. To me, I don't think common sense tells me we will not be able to incorporate everything every commissioner represents into our work program. And I okay. think... Uh, council, I, I, okay, I'm sorry to cut you off. Please, go ahead. Please. That's okay. I, I just think we should keep the original language. Uh, council Member Moore? 
I agree with keeping the original language. However, when I was requesting to see the other portion, which was being changed, I don't think that I was looking at staff screen. So before we, before you call the question, uh, I want to see what staff says uh, that text is. Okay, I don't, I, I don't. The staff. I don't believe. Yeah, I want the staff to show me. I can do that. Who's, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's, I'm sorry, hold on, hold okay. on. Keep, keep sharing um, oh. Vice Mayor Chow's screen. Um, so since we're on that right now, let, let's let's circle back to what, what Council Member Moore is, is talking about in, in a moment. So um, let me ask um, Council Member Willie, are you supportive of the language that Council Member, that Vice Mayor Chow is suggesting here? Uh, that we change the sentence and the original to the two sentences that she is providing uh, on the bottom paragraph here. I I like the uh, sentence from Vice Mayor Chow in the sense that I truly believe we should be relying heavily on our commissions. If we're not going to rely heavily on the commissions, then you know, what's their real um, pur purpose? The first one says, you know, <clears throat> reach out to, but no, I, I think it needs to be more definitive than that. Do we need to rectify it tonight? Mm. But I, I do like the, sentence, the second one better. Um, we do, we really should be leveraging the... Uh, the commissions are comprised of the residents of Cupertino. They're not paid staff. And their recommendations for the city work program are really going to emanate from the residents of Cupertino, not from a business perspective. So I like that one better. If we, if we can't get... Um, uh, concurrence on that tonight, you know, then maybe we we do it as a uh, update, but okay. I do like the second one better. So I, I, I hear you. Uh, understood. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Willie, and um, let, let, let me revisit the other council members. I, I would like to get consensus on this. Um, Vice Mayor Chow has modified the second sentence. Uh, it, it's no longer a mandate. The recommendations from commissions will be considered in the creation of the first draft of the city uh, work program. Um, you know, it, it's in the passive, uh, considered is uh, identified. It, there's no mandate of uh, every item identified will be in there uh, in the first draft. Is this, is this workable for, uh, let's start with um, council member Moore, now that the modification has been made by uh, Vice Mayor Chow. I see no reason to do it. That means my question. I, I don't. I thought it was fine in the original. Um, the the alteration in the second. I see no reason to um, make that change. It's it's not providing enough difference and uh, changing the direction to make it worth our while. Okay, and, so and it will take his staff time to change this. I mean, so right, it's, so not, it's not free. Well. Okay, uh, so so thank you. That I'm, I'm hearing a no there, uh, Council Member Way. Are okay, you so so here it is. Um, we are still listening to the commissioners. Is I worry about putting this on the commissioner to initiate it. I think the staff needs to initiate because staff is the one who knows the timing. So if you just put like this, and and I just feel that we are still on the first sentence. The it will. The commissioner's voice are still being heard and will be added to the uh, recommendations for our city's uh, work program. So I, I don't see the difference in why I see the burdens on the staff to reach out to the commissioners is more appropriate because the staff knows the timing. They know what to do. You put this on the commissioners, they might not even initiate it if they don't know it's the timing out of it. So I am fine with the first language okay i got it i got it okay so uh this is what i'll commit to you vice mayor chow um i'm gonna go ahead and support the original language here um 
but I'm going to pocket the language that you're putting there. I'm, I'm going to observe the process this year. And if it seems like, you know, more definitive language is, is required in order to um, exhort our staff to reach out to the commissions in good faith and reflect that in the first draft of our work program, um, then I, I commit to you that I'll revisit this and, uh, and support uh, modification next year. Now let's go back to what council yes. member. Remember, this is commissioner's handbook, not the staff handbook. Yeah, but so we're 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 is, approving this. We 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 are approving the language to it. So we mm -hmm. uh, have within our purview, as you can see by this exercise, uh, the ability to modify the language. So council member Moore uh, made a request that she wanted to see the language that was up uh, on Katie's screen with regard to the page nine modification. Uh, and, and so that will stand as the existing motion. Um, can you see, can, are you able to see that? This is required for quasi-judicial matters and add a footnote for the imposed restraints document. Okay. Uh, to clarify, uh, Mayor Paul, um, so if, if you had, for my example, for um, the uh, bike head commission, um, perhaps there would be a discussion about a trail. Okay, so um, what if one of the commissioners had spoken to various members of the public that would be impacted by this trail? Um, would that, uh, because they're, they're making recommendations, would they then not need to mention their ex parte communications? Um, mm -hmm. Likewise, I mean, we have some some businesses that could be impacted by trails. Um, would they have to speak about that or not? I think the answer I, is I, they I, don't. Let me answer the question this way. Whether we add this red language or whether we do not add this red language, the content of the first part of the sentence is still a should, uh, which to my way of reading is this is something you should do. We're not telling you that you must do it. Um, so I, I think this, this language at the end clarifies the point that there are legal requirements in which this must be done, and that's a quasi-judicial matter. However, um, we're really trying to provide best practices here in an effort to um, provide good public process and open disclosure. Um, so so I, in my way of reading this, this is actually a clarification um, and also serves to uh, it really helped to define the parameters of what we're talking about in this last sentence. Um, you know, it, it's it's a, it's an encouragement uh, to make these disclosures. Okay. Uh, but but I don't I don't read this you know in even in the original language as creating a mandate. Excuse me, Mayor Paul. Um, I think that if if the point is it, making uh, the statement about quasi judicial matters, then when it is re with regards to the planning commission, I would make this language more strong um, so that planning commissioners in particular are, are reminded of this um, rather than not indicating, you know, who this is, who is going to be subject to this. So if you, if you want to put this in and talk about it, um, make it super clear um, who falls under that. I, I would say Add disclosure, you know, this is required. Let's just say this disclosure is required for quasi-judicial matters. I mean, I think the the issue with specifying is that you may end up not encompassing everything, um, you know, every situation. But uh, let's have the city attorney speak to that as to whether we need to get more specific. Or, or I, think that's, I think there was an effort to try to simplify this document and um, to have the details come out if, as required in other resources and in consultation with the city attorney for specific issues. But it's up to the council how detailed they want this to be or not. I don't think it's a legal question of how, what you put in there or not right now. Imposed restraints document. Katie, where can members of the public find this imposed restraints document? Okay, sorry. Um, so at the end of the document, we have a commission resources folder where we do have the imposed uh, restraints document. And at the end of it, we do 
discuss quasi-judicial quasi proceedings. Okay. I can display that if you would like. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, I, and I see it now, um, but if I'm just reading the handbook, I, I think you should say it in the commission resources folder because- Right, I think that was the purpose of the footnote. I could also just put yeah. it in the sentence if that is more clear. Right, no, no, no. if that's gonna be captured in the footnote, that's, that's fine. Okay, so impose restraints. <clears throat> Hold on. I just wanna take a quick look at this. Uh, impose restraints, conflict of interest, public records laws. Um, individuals serving on the audit committee, bike ped, fine arts, housing commission, library commission, parks and rec, planning, public safety, sustainability, and tick must file a statement of economic interest. Oh, that's the, the conflict of interest. Yeah, I, are you, is it in a different document, Katie, that we linked? I'm not seeing it in the imposed restraints right now, the definition of quasi-judicial. Yeah, it's a number, uh, or not number, but letter I, quasi-judicial proceedings. Oh, you know what? My printer <laughs> ran out of a paper, and so I didn't yeah, get that printer. <laughs> Thanks. No, I mean, letter I, There's this only goes up to letter H. It's, so is it not in the linked document, the full? Maybe that's uh, the I issue. I think it is. It may be something that we can address with the city clerk and our IT team to make sure that it's coming through. I just downloaded it, so and my version does have I. I can share that. Yeah, I mean, I downloaded it as well. My, my version only goes up to H. It's a, it's oh, a okay. So maybe it affects the time that you accessed it. Well. Can you see that? Quasi. Yes. Mayor Paul, may I ask a quick question? Uh, Council Member Moore. Thank you. Um, so who beyond the uh, the Planning Commission out of the commissions um, makes quasi-judicial decisions? I can't think of an example right now. Yeah, I, I, I kind of didn't think there were any. Um, and uh, we get briefed on that. Um, uh, several times over. So I'm not sure that even the addition of the red line is necessary when you are training the, the commission, um, you know, with the city attorney, with the planning commission academy and the, the, the information that we're given, um, I, they should know that. Uh, so I, I'm not sure we, we need to even add this in. Um, and I like that you uh, have the statement um, that they should, people should, you know, like I'm asking, you should provide transparency um, to the public, even if it isn't a, a quasi-judicial decision, like um, the, the example I gave you about the bike trail. I mean, I, I understand what your concern is. Um, so, so don't get me wrong, you know, just you know, because if I'm not, if I'm not, ultimately voting, you know, in this direction. I, I would like to try to get us to a uh, consensus uh, on, on these modifications. I, th I think the, the concern you raise is, is a bit more of a, a stick, right? I mean, it's really more of a, you know, do this, you know, disclose it. Um, and let's not add ambiguity to it. Let's not add like, you know, kind of a shade of, well, you have to do it here. So maybe you don't have to, you know, I, I mean, I, I think I, I, I'm okay with the language that um, Vice Mayor Chow is, is adding to it. Um, but let me let me just revisit this. Vice Mayor Chow, after hearing this discussion, would you be okay with going back to the original language? Would you support that? With the original language, my question is how do you how are you asking people to comply? For example, suppose for safe and dark sky is being voted on today. So Kitty, how would you disclose all the discussion you've ever had about on this topic? And Wei, how would you disclose that? Are you keeping a list of everyone you've ever um, talked to? 
Mayor Prof, should I can I talk? Uh, yes, I, I thank you for observing that procedure. Uh, Chair recognizes Council Member Way. Okay, so um, so this is a commissioner's training. It's a book for them to be trained. It is really best practice when you are dealing with an issue, you talk about where you got that information, like Katie said. So I don't, if somebody forgets, we're not gonna hold him or her responsible. Uh -huh. So it's a training process and I think it's good to have them. I, I like the original language, you know, advise them, this is the best practice that you should do. But even if they don't remember, since it's not a quasi um, judiciary matters, it, it probably doesn't matter. We're not gonna like, break your brand, who did you talk to? So I'm just thinking the training, so, um, this handbook for the training commissioner is really good. I, I like how it's uh, being okay, worded. Let me, let me clarify, okay. And so planning commission like, seems to get the second training, so right? So it uh, sounds, yeah. but the, the current language, it sounds like, okay, before I make any comments, I need to use my five minutes to talk, to make a list of 20 people who I've ever talked to and uh, what they said. This is what I read from the current language. But what, what Han Wei is saying is, okay, if I want to make my three points, then I should disclose these three points I heard from whom. So I only make, I only need to talk about these three points and uh, if I heard it from other people, I disclose who I heard it from. Oh yeah, I'm cutting you off. Let's uh, hear from Council Member Moore. She has her hand raised. Uh, thank you, Mayor Paul. Um, so, one thing um, in, in, for our procedure, when you start, um, after you finish the study session or, or, or you've finished the staff report, you, um, or actually even before that, you could be asking, uh, were there any ex parte communications? In fact, the, the, the meeting flow that I was given has a part where I specifically would ask for ex parte communications and you are, you're supposed to make that request and, and then we talk about who, the, who we spoke to. Um, and that's supposed to be part of our process. Um, if we haven't been following it, then that should be followed because that's something for transparency's sake we should be doing. Um, and it's probably good practice for the other, uh, other commissions to be doing that as well. Um, but, you know, again, that's up to, um, I guess, the, the council if they want to have that type of procedure um, and to provide a flow chart for the meetings in the future um, might be pretty beneficial. Thank you. Oh, yeah, through the chair, through the chair. We're talking about... All right, no, 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 council, no, Vice Mayor Chow, you're not raising your hand. You're not asking yeah. me to speak. So don't, don't interrupt. This is not a free for all. All right. Would you like I to be was asking them questions. No, so no, I, I'm just telling you, the procedure. do not interrupt people. Okay. Speak through the chair. All right. All right, I'll, I'll recognize you, Vice Mayor Chow. Okay, sorry. So, ex parte communication was for quasi-judicial matters that has very limited scope. Everything have to be put on the table for that decision. But when we make policy decisions, a lot of times like birth safe, it goes on for many meetings and we might be talking to people for over one or even two years, like for general plan amendment. You might be talking to 10, 20 people. How are you going to disclose everything? I, I know that there, there, we have public records requests, we have all these things, but then you are saying that everything I say, I have to tell where I heard it from. I might have read from 10 different articles. So how, how are we going to do that in practice? It's not really possible, right? And if someone really are having some ex parte communication, they really don't want you to know, they are not going to tell you. So it really serves no purpose. Okay, Councilmember Moore, you have your hand raised. And I just want you to know that um, after one more set of comments, I'm gonna be calling the question Whatever motion is on the table, uh, I'm re requesting that we, we vote on it. All right, okay. Council Member Moore. All I was going to suggest is that um, the city attorney address what uh, the vice mayor was um, 
mentioning there about the requirements for ex parte communications for city council. And that's something that can be taken offline for city council members to know what they need to disclose. And also have a, I might suggest that we have a, a recap for the planning commission um, and a reminder um, for that commission for what they need to disclose there as well. Uh, I'm going to call a point of order there because the disclosure requirements of council are not on the table here. Uh, these are this is the commissioner handbook. Um, my interpretation of what Vice Mayor Chow was saying is when she say I, when she said I, I think she was transposing herself into the in, into the position of a commissioner or the or an audit committee member. Correct me if I'm wrong, Council uh, Vice Mayor Chow. Yeah. But, okay, so so so. I, I, City Attorney Minner, if you want to answer that question very briefly, fine, but I, I don't think it's related to our, the topic of our discussion right now as to what our requirements are on council in terms of disclosure. Yeah, it's it's the same whether it's commission or, or council. Um, and so it's required for quasi-judicial matters if, you've, if you're making your decision based, if you have received information that is not otherwise in the public record, you must disclose it. Um, and 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 who, where you got that information from for legislative matters, it's not a requirement. But as this um, language says, that um, you it's best practice to note that. I, I would put the emphasis not on who you've met with, but this second clause that says to ensure that everyone is aware of the facts and have similar information. So the, the emphasis is really if you're getting information that isn't otherwise in the record, you should let everybody else know about that so that they can understand it and consider it too, so that they are hearing the same information you're hearing. Oftentimes when people meet with constituents, the constituents are sharing information that is already in the record through comments they've made or um, it's the information in the staff report and that, that's okay, less Mayor, important to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, City Attorney. Um, and our, uh, Vice Mayor Chow, you have your hand raised? Yeah. So. Um, could city attorney clarify for the public what is quasi-judicial and why for quasi-judicial matters because it's of the limited state scope, I think it's practical to require disclosure of extra parte communication. But for legislative matters, if you are requiring people to disclose everything put so that everyone knows the same thing, then every commissioner is going to take 30 minutes to talk about everything they have ever discussed with other people. We are not, ever, we cannot limit that so you have only five minutes. So how, how in practice we can implement that? Okay, la so last question. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor Chow, um, city attorney, brief answer. Uh, how, how is someone- I, I think the brief the answer is it's not being required in this handbook, it's being suggested. <laughs> And, and I would ask, and I would suggest that it, when people interpret that, they focus on any new information they've received and are using to make their decision that other people don't have, which I okay. think we often do. And it's part of the discussions. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a last call. We do have a motion on the table. We do have a second. Um, and so uh, if there are uh, no further comments, if there are no other procedural um, asks, I'm going to ask that the city clerk uh, conduct a roll call vote on the motion on the table. Council member Moore. Aye. Council member Way. Aye. Council member Willie. Aye. Vice Mayor Chow. Aye. Mayor Paul. Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Very good. Um, that, that was a great discussion and I, I, I don't want anyone to feel deflated uh, by it. Uh, I think a lot of the suggestions were really good ones, um, and, and they were all very good suggestions. And, and I would say that the, um, the 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 nuggets of information, for example, such as suggesting that uh, commissions take in as practice, you know, asking for disclosures, th those are those are great. I, I really appreciate the comments. So thank you very much for all the thought that's gone into this. Uh, we are uh, completed with all of our enumerated items on our council agenda now. Um, we do have council and staff comments on future agenda items. Um, I'm going to be setting a limit uh, on this. Um, I think it just needs to be uh, concise. Uh, it needs to be with the uh, commentary and some 
um, some suggestions of future agenda items. So uh, three minutes at the most, everyone. Um, would anyone like to go first on this? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, Council Member Willie. <clears throat> so trying to be real brief. So uh, number one is the uh, G5 uh, uh, cells in neighborhoods. Uh, can the city manager update me as to when that is going to be on our agenda? I guess I need clarification. What? A study session or something? Well, we've got so many emails from residents about their concerns of G G5 being pushed in residential areas, specifically by Verizon. And yeah, so let me give you a status first. That's what I'm asking, yeah. Okay, uh, status first is that there's four sites that got, <clears throat> excuse me, pushback, and you're right, it's Verizon. Um, I can't list them all, but we have them categorized. And each one of those is being worked um, for a different location, don't know where yet, by Verizon, along with city staff um, at the behest of those residents that live in that area. One of them's Tula, Tula Lane, one of them is Children. So there's four of them. I, um, and thank you for asking Council Member Willie, um, I forgot to update Council. I did have a conversation with uh, Verizon last week and um, we spoke about them not, not, uh, not um, submitting any more, any additional applications I, uh, at this time. I also asked them what their status was in our commercial zones. And while they uh, felt like their commer the commercial zones around here were kind of already done from their perspective, they agreed to focus there if there were a few more they wanted to put up. So no more in residential zones for no more further applications in residential zones. So that means the current ones that are being um, appealed, I'll call it, by by community members are being reviewed right now. Yeah, and, you know, I'm trying to make this real quick, but I, I still think what needs to come back to council, the uh, when when they say that the commercial area is already uh, finished, do they have a cell every 300 feet in commercial areas? No, they don't. So I, I think there's a very big misnomer about how um, how close together cell, these 5G cells have to be. Yeah. And that greatly affects the residential area. That greatly affects the residential area. So, so I do, do think yeah, it needs so to come the, back. The other, and the other thing I was asked to do, which I thought was a good idea, is I'm putting a matrix together of um, all the surrounding cities around here. So, you know, Great. Yes, cities. that's right. Mm -hmm. And kind of what the status is in each one and what's happening in each one with regard to 5G. I did publish a little bit in my Friday update last week, but that's emerging information. Right. Um, so that's that's what I have now. As far as stuff coming back to council, I just, I'm at a loss for what more we can say about it because you've had four study sessions in the time that I've been here. You've modified the guidelines this one time, and it seems to have prevented us from creating a prohibition, which is what other cities have been sued for. So I feel like we've threaded the needle. I also provided a very comprehensive email to council right now that you could, if you were trying to put the education out there, send to other people that had FAQs. It had FAQs from Berkeley. It had... Um, a connection to our web page that had the four study session taped right there. And I am um, I will follow up with our new council members because they were gonna go dig in through that stuff and make sure that they were fully up to speed as possible before doing oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to cut you off. Uh, Councilman yeah. Rowley, do you have anything else um, that you wanted to bring up? I'm gonna quit there for tonight, but when did you send out that package so that I can go and refresh my memory? It was a while ago. I can resend if you'd like me to. Yeah, do would that. you resend when you do I the new council members? Will. Resend. I will so just that, resend it to great. all council. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that'll be it for Thanks tonight. So council member Moore has her hand up next. Okay. Um, with regards to the G5, um, with the cells, uh, 
I'm a little concerned about the corner of Stevens Creek Boulevard and Wolf and how that change happened at that intersection um, because the, there was an alteration of the lane there. So I'm, I'm curious about um, when does a modification to an intersection need to have perhaps further noticing of the area because it affects people all driving through that intersection. That's one. Um, I don't know if the upper level balcony um, code has been changed, but uh, there was an item that came to City Council Council last year uh, regarding, I believe it was last year, regarding a very large upper um, upper balcony. And uh, if we, if that ever had been changed, because there were some problems with that. Um, and I'm going to mention again, um, this has come back a couple of times, uh, can we get the lobbying ordinance going? And just um, for moving ahead, if we can have um, some additional trainings for uh, commissioners and city council members who might want to attend them as well, um, getting into more complicated um, uh, meeting uh, policies and following, following both Rosenberg's rules and Roberts, if we have to encounter that on some of these outside committees that we're on as well. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Great, thanks for the great suggestion, Steph. Anybody care to address uh, council member Moore's points? I can do that. I can uh, do it in yes, part. Uh, Rosenberg's rules is going to be part of the training. I mean, and what you'll find is it sometimes is a little confusing if you're in other bodies, which you are. <clears throat> some of them use Robert's rules still, and some of them will use Robert, Rosenberg's rules, but it can be stylized a little bit. So it'll be slightly different as you go to each one of these different committees. We are prepared to do Rosenberg's rules in these upcoming series of training. Um, Robert's rules, we were not prepared to train because we don't use them anymore. So it doesn't make any sense to, to train people on that. As far as the light pole you're talking about at Stevens Creek and uh, Wolf, it is a light pole that was legitimately reconfigured there. It just happened to be right when we were doing the that modification to the lane. It is a light pole only. Um, mm -hmm. So there's yeah. no, that huge thing needed to be designed that way. It, Yes, oh, um, and I good. think I sent you a little more detailed email on that too. If you okay, I'll hunt it down. Oh, it's um, huge. So this, um, talked about uh, lobbying. We are moving that forward. It is getting a little more complicated, but we will bring it forward as soon as possible, um, for sure. That's not a work program item, right? No, it's not. It came over the, it came off the dais, but we do have it on list of. Um, future items that we keep the list of. And so we are actually uh, working it, but um, yeah, it's. Um, okay, so one last item, Mayor Paul, I don't I don't know if, if there had been a change to the um, balcony um, ordinance uh, because there was a project where it was essentially being used to make a really large second story. In Monta Vista, out. it was a house in Monta Vista is what I recall. And, right. I and there was some talk about the ordinance change. So. We didn't change the ordinance, if I recall correctly, and that person has not come back. Okay, so it's just something to think about if if we want to do that in the future. Okay, uh, is that someone remind me? Is that is that on our work program, or is that a potential item to add to it for the next year? I, I honestly don't remember. I, I remember it being brought up um, during that item, um, and I thought it was a good idea. I just don't remember what our follow up was to that. Um, okay, so we'll we'll look into that. Thank you, Councilmember Moore, Vice Mayor Chow. You're next. Um, okay, so can we add an FAQ for Lehigh and the <coughs> did you Stevens Creek Quarry? I think we ha all have some questions that's not answered, and this is a project that's going to be ongoing for the next one or two years. So maybe have an FAQ for some common questions. Uh, I believe we have FAQs posted to both websites, but here's what I want. It, I was going to send an email after this meeting to council. If you have any lingering questions from this particular session, please send them to me and I'll consolidate them and get them to Roger, who will get them to uh, the county to answer. And then we'll post those. Great. Yeah, I'd like to know the answers too. Just send me, the e send me an email with the questions because we didn't get all of them. And I know you had some leftovers, and so did um, Council Member Moore. And then for the small cell issue, as I remember, um, December 15th, at the end, we got, I think, almost four 
or five council members all want to revisit it because uh, I think the community members, Peter Chu, um, and many others pointed out the inconsistency of our regulation right now. Things will require 100 feet from playground, and while well, it's 20 feet from um, bedroom windows. And, can and we that. don't have an uh, ordinance right now. So right now, we only have a regulation, I believe. At that time, all four council members said, okay, let's revisit. So Except if, that I, I don't, no, the question I, I, I want to ask is, okay, now that it's an item that's requested by all four council members or maybe five, if the staff is deciding this is not necessary, what should be the process? Because I, no, I, need to add, I, I was need to also add expecting it will come back like the community members who are asking when is going to be on the agenda. Can and I now I'm asking out. Can I provide no, one some time, feedback? One at a time. Uh, Vice Mayor Chow, okay, you're done, right? Yeah. Okay. okay, city manager. So at the end of the December 15th session, yes, there were multiple people asking for um, another study session. However, I don't think that's going to actually do anything. So the compromise in the interim before we do yet another study session was for me to consolidate all the 5G information and give it to you because you really have, it's complicated. So you really must read through everything and make the connection back into our administrative guidelines, which are just as strong as any municipal code. We are adhering to the administrative guidelines. There aren't any inconsistencies in it. You must read through all the FAQs. There's even a connection to the, we, mod we took out the FAQs that we saw from Berkeley and we, we put those in there too. I will resend the comprehensive one so that you all can look at that first. There is inconsistency. Sorry, there is inconsistency even with our I just say from, instead ordinary. of talking about substance, we talk about whether getting additional information from the city manager is sufficient or whether somebody would like to ask to have a new um, item placed okay. on the agenda and yeah. I will still request it to be placed on the agenda because I don't think the city manager has authority to determine whether there is inconsistency whether the the ordinance needs to be made consistent and, and that's and, something the, the council has to decide and mm -hmm. we John and I have I think maybe Katie or Hanwei has requested that if they change their mind fine but that's something they should decide, not the so. Thing. So there's one request from Council Member Chow to have an additional study session, and if there's a second, it'll go yeah, on. I the, second it. Right, and so then it'll go on the future agenda items for the city manager and the mayor to schedule. Okay, that's process, and um, similar to in the future, more. please don't change. Don't try make to make decision for the council. And if you I did not, there is at a, the end of the December fifteenth. No. At the end of the December fifteenth council meeting, you all allowed me to send the information out first before determining whether there would be another study session. Please go watch the tape. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, no more free for all. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, uh, I think I think we're 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 definitive on that. And then uh, Councilmember Willie, Councilmember Moore. Uh, Vice Mayor Chow, you've all exhausted your three minutes. Uh, Council Member Wei. Uh, so I, I would like to um, really receive the comprehensive information first so that we, we I can read through all of them and then get an understanding of it before requesting a, uh, well, a study session or on the, on, the, uh, on the agenda. So I really appreciate the information first. That, that's what I need to say. Thank you. Yeah, you have it, you have okay. it. Okay, you don't have any other reports or requests for future items? No, no. I'm, I, I think we have a lot of things on the agenda that's coming up, and I love to learn, so I would like to you guys to set it up, and then I'm on a learning curve. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so I, I, I see two things. I, I'm not going to evade um, your, your request for a study session. Um, I, I, I think... I think if we're looking at the future agenda items at this point, it's been clear you've got multiple people. Um, I know that March is getting to be pretty busy. I'm looking at April at this point. Um, work with us, give us some time or give staff some time. I'm, I'm not aligning myself with, it, with any kind of um, you know, positioning there. 
but give staff some time to give you that baseline information, um, absorb it. Uh, please try to communicate it to the people that reach out to you. Um, I think we can have a, a good faith informational session and a discussion. Um, and uh, what I'm looking at right now is probably somewhere about in the time frame of April. <clears throat> um, probably no sooner, frankly. All right, second item I did. Um, so, so yes, the city attorney is right. Um, two council members can place an item on our items of interest, and not, not on our future agenda items, rather. Um, I, as mayor, working together with the city manager, uh, determine the timing uh, of that item. Now, um, I, I did ask for uh, this lobbying registration requirement. It was very popular. It indeed did get uh, four out of five of our council members. Um, in my last meeting with, with staff and setting the agendas for this meeting and our next meeting, I did ask about that. Uh, I made a request that this show up um, on our February 2nd meeting. Uh, I have not heard anything prior to our discussion right now with regard to why this would get delayed and to what time. And so that is my question. Um, why well, is this we're on track to make February 2nd. Yeah. That's I don't think it too. needs to be delayed. I just think there's more complications. So it can come to February 2nd. We might delay implementation. We might suggest a few things, but it'll come to February on February 2nd. Okay. Okay. So that was my question. Um, and I need a I need a point of clarification. Uh, Council Member Moore suggested a modification to balcony sizes. I didn't hear a second. I think we were checking to see if that's already on the work program or not. Yeah, and we'll get back on that. If it's not, I second that because I do think it's something that's going to continue to grow. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And Councilmember Willie, you have your hand up still. Um, although, you, you know, I, I will say everyone's pretty much exhausted their time um, with the possible exception of Councilmember Way if she wants to, you know, allocate any uh, to the rest of us. Um, however, um, I want to congratulate everyone. You know, our original timing for this was 11.05, although we did take out two items. Uh, I think you have to give back a little for the fact that our postponements themselves uh, involve elaborate discussions. Um, so we're before midnight, as uh, as I had promised. Um, so thank you for working with me there. Um, unless there are last burning things that you want to tell the public, and I mean within 30 seconds at the very most, I, I see a, a head shake from John, which is great, Councilmember Boyley rather. Um, I, I want to reiterate my thanks. Um, we're going to uh, reconvene on February 2nd. And so um, I will go ahead and adjourn uh, this meeting until our next regularly scheduled council meeting. Thank you very much and good night.